Mr. Labello, I just want to make one thing very clear. Um, you've spoken about Advocate Brassy, and you'll remember there was a bit of correspondence between you and your attorney, which was not very complimentary of me, that you uh, cc'd to me. Remember that? And you'd said in there, why don't they speak to Brassy? Well, we have spoken to Mr. Brassy, and I just want to make it clear that we accept uh, Mr. Brassy drew that chart sheet, and we accept as well that uh, that he wouldn't have done so, as he, and, he, and I accept it without reservation, unless he felt he had a proper basis for drawing that chart sheet. So let me get that absolutely clear, that, uh, that Advocate Brassy would have had a, in his mind at least, whether he's right or wrong doesn't matter. I mean, advocates can be wrong. You know how many times they told me I've been wrong in the courts? But, uh, but we accept that, that Advocate Brassy felt he had a basis for the chart sheet. So... Please continue. Thanks, thanks so much. The, and maybe to make the point as well, that I'm not sitting here saying somebody's guilty. I'm just sitting here and say, at the time, Advocate Brezze, the team thought there is a case to be answered. There is a prima facie case to be answered. Now, the memo, the memo, so, so I've mentioned the issues that the memo raises. And the memo gets signed by the Deputy Minister at the time it was De Deputy Minister Muleketi. And he signs the memo, but he says, he makes a comment, which is an interesting comment that supported, however, this is, this is an, it's a strange way of executing what I consider to be an economic mandate by NIA. It seems as though it's an add-on rather than part of the NIA mandate. And this is approved on the 22nd of, of, of October, as you can see on page 31. Now. That's October 2008. Seven. Seven. Seven, seven yeah. No, sorry, sorry, I'm saying October, no, February. No, let's get the date correct. Yes, is it it's February, yes. 2007. 2007, the 22nd of February, that is when the minister signed. Now, I want to then take, and the important thing here to draw from at least the investigators was that SARS seemed to acknowledge itself at this time that they don't have a legislative mandate. That's why they want the minister to give them money to help to establish, to establish this in the in the uh, in the NIA. So I want Let's to... Let's just say uh, Mr. Mr. Gordon seems to uh, assume that, but Mr. Pillay had been advised a few days earlier that SARS actually does have the legislative mandate to do that. Now the only difficulty is that Mr. Pillay has also signed the memo. So... No, I understand, but w have you got that? You said you'd hadn't, you didn't have that document. No. Uh, I'm surprised. Why didn't you have that other document, the opinion, when you started? No, but, but it was in your file, so that's where we found it. In the file? Not in your, the ones you gave me, but in the SARS <coughs> records. I'm no, no, surprised I, that I, it wasn't there. Can, we, can you just show it to him? It just... Uh, what... what? Just look at, I think, at the last paragraph. She probably, he or she, I don't know. I've never, I've never seen the document. So that wasn't available. To, uh, that wasn't. You didn't see that at the time you took this action. No, no. We, like, like I said, the, this is the work that was done somewhere, and people came and said this is what they found. Could you please just read for me again that uh, note by uh, Deputy Minister Mlegeti? Okay, so, so it's understood that the memo is asking for money to form a unit mm. helping NIA. Yeah. I just want that, that, part. that note. It says supported, however, this is a strange way of executing what I consider to be an economic mandate of NIA. It seems as though this is an add-on rather than part of the NIA mandate. So you were saying that you the NIA, as far as was concerned, already had that mandate. Yes, so he's saying NIA has got the mandate. And, and, and that, that confirms, and, and, and I don't want to get much, but that confirms in the, in the, in the eyes of the investigators that, that that part become confirmed that this is the mandate of the NIA. But the, but the minister does not suggest that it has the exclusive mandate. No, no, no. 
That's, that's not what we are saying. All, all we are saying is, on paragraph 2.1, SARS is, is in its own memo acknowledged that it doesn't have a legislative mandate to do this. And that's why it's asking money to establish in the NIA. That, that's what, that is what it established. Now, if, if, I take, if I take the commission to page 30, 33, no, no, no. So, so page 28, on page 28, and this is where the contradiction come where they wanted Mr. Pillay to explain in that here, is that it looks like by the 8th of February 2007, he sent a memo, which memo establishes this unit. So let me, let me explain the difference. So the memo goes to the minister, leaving SARS on the 2nd. The minister approves it on the 22nd. And that memo says, give us 49 million rand almost to form a unit so that this unit can operate within NIA because we don't have a mandate. Only to find that earlier than that, on the 8th of February, Mr. Pillay is forming the very same unit with the same terms. Why do you say that? that, what, is that what is that document? Can I, can I help? It's, it's page 29. So this is an internal memorandum. Um, it's from Mr. Pillay to Mr. Magashula, who at that stage was the chief operating, the chief operator the Chief Officer, Corporate Services, 8th of February 2007. So this is days after Mr. Pillay has been told he can, in fact, uh, lawfully set up a unit. And he seems to be acting on it because he says the topic is specialized capability to focus on the illicit economy, and the purpose is to obtain approval for the appointment of personnel with specialized capabilities, in brackets, internal and external. And uh, under discussion, it says, combating smuggling of prohibited goods and substance is part of SARS mandate. And as you may know, a need exists for a specialized capacity to enable SARS to make inroads in understanding the illicit economy in order to take decisive steps to minimize the following, and there's a list including smuggling of cigarettes and uh, importation of counterfeit goods, illegal importation of secondhand vehicles, illegal harvesting of abalone and its supply, importation, exportation, and manufacturing of drugs. Uh, fundamental to combating the illicit economy is the capability to penetrate and intercept the activities of crime syndicates. A memo explaining the need for creating such capacity with a high degree of operational security to address illicit economy has been submitted to the minister. The Customs Border Control Unit's recruitment process was utilized to shortlist and assess potential candidates. And the recommendation that he asks uh, be approved, in pursuance of the above, it is proposed that SARS create the special capability through the appointment of 14 external resources and the transfer of 12 internal resources from the Enforcement and Risk Division, and then it refers to Annexure A. The structure of this new capability is attached as Annexure B. The posts, 26, should be obtained from CBCU and transferred to the GM Enforcement and Risks Cost Center to protect the identities and personal information of the employees. Okay, so what yeah. do Yeah, so, so <coughs> the point is that on the, on, the, on the one side, you are forming a unit. As you look at the, at the purpose of that, I mean, if you look at the purpose of the memo, it says, you know, we don't have the capability and the whatever, and that's why we want to form it there. On the other side, you're forming a unit. Where, which, where are you forming a unit? He's talking about capability. No, no, no. And, and maybe that's why I was, I was disrupted a bit. So, so where I referred to the commission is where then there is a memo that 
before the minister approves the money, there is a memo already which shows that people have been recruited, people are ready to accept jobs. And I want to take the commission to, to, to pages 30. There is a structure on page 30. And you'll see that the following employees already accepted offers on this day for that unit. Yeah. Well, well, you keep on saying the unit, the capability. I don't know if this is now the capability within NIA or a separate unit. What? Okay. You, he only doesn't talk about a unit. He talks okay. about a capability. Okay. So which is what? Sorry. Which is what had been said in the earlier memorandum to the minister. Yes. The capability memo, within NIA. Yeah. The memo. The memo to the minister says we are requesting 48.9 million to work to help uh, NIA to form this unit, which will deal, among other things, in the city economy. Because we acknowledge we don't have a mandate. But on page 29, and that memo is, is approved on the 22nd, but on page 29, you have already recruited people for the units. You already got a, a, a approval from from HR, and in fact, on page 30, Van Rensberg has already accepted an offer on the 14th of February, always noting the 22nd. Duval has already accepted on the 15th. Cal Foria has already accepted on the 16th. Keith Hector has already accepted on the 17th, and Anton Vogt has already accepted on the 15th. And it's important because all I'm saying is that this created a discrepancy for, for a prima facie evidence of either the memo that went to the minister was intended to mislead the minister, or because, because then what, what happens to the 49 million is not very clear, so they couldn't get any information. So they concluded that somebody must explain that you're asking the minister for the 49 million, but a few days before that you've already formed the unit. What happened to the 49 million? Because also in terms of treasury rules, you can't ask for money to, to buy a house and then you use it to buy something else. So, so Brazen, the team, uh, Advocate Brazen, the team, said Mr. Pillay had to explain well, yeah, this discrepancy. I, I think we must and, be, and, I'm and sorry, don't tell us what Mr. Brassi said, because I don't want to embarrass Mr. Brassi by having someone else interpret what he said. No, no, I'm saying, I'm saying this is the evidence that they told us, and this is the argument that they said they have yeah. for the charges. So could, that's, that's all could, could you help me exactly on that? You have the letter or the memo to the minister which ultimately gets signed on the 22nd, and having been um, signed by the deputy commissioner and, and the then commissioner on about the 2nd. <coughs> what I want to really just get, I want to get, that you help us just zoom into these two bits. The 8th of um, Feb, that you've just, uh, that council has just read to us. Are these supposed to be exclusive of one another or inclusive of one another? Maybe let me put it more simply. There's one bit around setting up, enabling the NIA to set up certain capability. And you have on this memo or of about the 8th, am I correct? 8th of Feb, requests for setting up certain positions in relation to other capability. Are we saying that it is not, it's, con it's inconceivable that the NIA would have been funded for a certain portion of the capability, which in any event the Deputy Minister of Finance had already said in his view, they already had that capability. They already had uh, that mandate. I was saying that you could not possibly have set up a certain capability within NIA and still set up perhaps some corresponding capability uh, within SARS when one takes into account that they had already received, at least Mr. Mr. Pillay had received advice saying that it was okay to do so. It was okay for SARS to create that capability. And, and, and the impression I'm getting now, I, I don't know, the opinion that's now, that you've now seen for the first time, was that ever brought to the attention of Advocate Press? No, 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 not as far as I know. But, but I think the important thing here is that 
prima facie, it looks like the same request that they make into the minister is the same thing that they have already established as a unit. Because the, the reasons for establishing the unit before the minister and the reason for the memo are the same is to deal with the illicit economy. But what is important is this is an allegation that the, 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 the prosecutor or whoever that was, running the, was, that was running the hearing wanted Mr. Pile to explain. It can be explained like I'm saying, I'm not saying they are guilty or anything. I'm saying this was the reason why the charge was made to say that the establishment of the unit, it's not correct that the establishment of the unit was, was done by the minister because the minister never approved any unit. He approved money to establish a unit for, SS, for, for NIA, not, not for SARS. But on the other side, it looks like the very same unit does the same thing. And, and as you look, Sorry, as you just see, finish that on the other side? On the other side, it looks like the same, the unit that they are saying that they don't have a, a legal mandate for, they already established it before. Yeah, but I, I, don't, I don't see that that's a necessary inference. Oh. So they're hiring people. Why, is it, why should we not infer that they're hiring people already in anticipation of putting them within NIA, because that's what, what they wanted to do. They wanted the money in order to hire people. NIA was not going to pay for this. To hire people to put into a, 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 a ring-fenced unit within NIA. So I'm not sure why you say we should draw the inference that set up an, a no, the, unit outside the NIA. The difficulty is, Judge, that in terms of the policy, when you set that structure, you must have budget. Yeah. Here they're requesting for money. Yeah. And the fair inference is that they don't have money at the time. Yeah. So they, they could not have recruited in anticipation of the minister. If, if the request was to say to the minister, we want to, to form a, a unit, but we already have a money, but we just want you to form a unit, it's different. But here you are requesting for money. It means you don't have money to form the unit. You want to have the money to form the unit. And that is the inference. Okay, but well, like I said, I, I'm saying this is what I understand. caused the oxymoron. It caused the contradiction to say somebody must explain and, and the investigators felt that it must be explained. Okay. And it can be explained. I'm not saying it can yeah. be explained. Yeah. But I'm, I'm, the only question I'm trying to understand, I mean, the, the question I'm raising, trying to understand something from you, is whether in the view of SARS, perhaps let me say in the view of Mr. Libello, it was inconceivable that you could create some capability within SARS which you have already been told by your own internal legal advisors that you can create certain capability and still perhaps fund, enable the funding of certain capability within NIA. Those could not work hand in hand. Yeah, that's what I'm saying, Prima Faki. It clearly looks that like the unit that was formed before the memo of the minister was to do exactly what it is mentioned in the minister's letter, Prima Faki. Because prima facie simply means somebody can come with a with a bomb and, and explain himself. Out. But but remember, this is what Brazil's investigation takes us through and say these are the evidence that we have. We believe we can prove this. And and and, and, and like I said, we we really didn't want not that we are not con not that we didn't interfere, but we, we we really if they gave us confidence because that was a that was a, a, a strong team of, of lawyers. I mean, I remember my uh, advocate Michael Van As was part of that. We 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 then say to them, if that is the case, then let it proceed. And, and our, our inclination was that Mr. Pile must just come and, and answer some of the questions. So you believe that you could prove that these two could not coexist? Yes. Remember, you remember, moved, on the face of it, you said something was to be answered yeah. because you believe that on the, on the face of it, these two could not coexist. Yes. Prima Faki, what I saw here was very clear that the two they're asking the same thing that they did before, and that is what they're doing here. And if advocates who are going to prosecute the matter also feel the same way, I respect that. Now, the, the, different, the point I'm really getting to is that I, I'm not querying whether there was a capability to be put at SARS as, and a capability to be put at NIA. I'm really trying to understand now from an employee relations perspective in, the, in devising these charges, if it was your view that there could never be a justification to have these two coexisting. No, firstly, like the judge said, the, the, the judges were not drafted by me, but, but they were for I you. I didn't listen to Mr. Kasha's question. It's always no, a good I, idea. I, I hear yeah. the question. The, judge, when you put a charge, 
And that's why you call it prima facie and you call it an allegation. It doesn't mean it can be disproved. But you believe that with what is before you, you have got more facts to prove it than the opponent. And, and in a lot of cases, people come and prove the allegations differently. Yeah. I suppose and I'm not taking that away yeah. that they can. What I'm trying to understand is, as far as you were concerned, did you consider it inconceivable that there would be certain capability lawfully established within SARS in addition to capability to be funded within the NIA? Were those contradictory? Yes. And I'll, I'll, let, let, me, let me explain why. So is your answer yes? Yes. But let, so me, let, me, just, yeah, let me just explain. If you look at page 29, the, the next memo, these are the documents he's got in front of him. It says the topic specialized capability to focus on the illicit economy. That's the memo I read out. Yes. Yeah. And if you go after A, B, C, D, and E. So so let, let me let me let me hang in there. So the purpose is a specialized capability to focus on illicit economy. When you go to the memo to the minister. Uh, the page number for the memo to the minister? Uh, the page number for the memo to the minister is page 30. And this one. No, I don't think it's page 30. Also page, page 31. 31. Page 31. 31 so. <coughs> so, so if you look at, if you look at the purpose, of the memo to the minister, you can, you can draw a conclusion of similarity. It says, to seek approval to, to fund a special capability within NIA to supply SARS and law enforcement agency with the necessary information to address the illicit economy. And also the, 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 the memo of the 29 talks about the purpose being to focus on illicit economy. And, and if you go on the memo of the 29th, far bottom, the way it starts with fundamental. The memo from the unit that was established says fundamentally to com combating the illicit economy is the capability to penetrate and intercept the activities of crime syndicates. A memo explaining the need for creating such capability with a high degree of operational security to address the illicit economy <coughs> has been submitted to the minister. Even that statement is not necessarily correct because what has been submitted to the minister is not the establishment of a structure. It's the request to have money to establish a structure somewhere else. So this contradiction has to be explained. But, but I don't know whether there's much to that contradiction, though, because if I look into page 30, you're looking at finding an intelligence capability within NIA in support of SARS. And if I then look into page 29, you're seeking approval for the appointment of personnel with specialized capabilities. And those capabilities could well have with, been within SARS. What I'm struggling with is why, in your assessment, you could not have had these coexisting. Why must it be the one or the other? And how come you come to that inference on the basis of what we're reading here? And, and I'll try to answer it. All I'm saying is the people who did the investigation believe they can prove the case. They took us through, and they showed us this contradiction. And it was fair to believe that there is a contradiction that needs to be explained. And the disciplinary is about that. The disciplinary is about the employer getting a feeling that something doesn't knock, and they put a, a charge together for you to answer. Well, um, I'm done on that. I, you know, I'm not sure we need to go through all of this, because, um, because as I've said to you, uh, your correct advocate, Brassie, drew the charges. Now, an advocate would not draw those charges unless he felt that there was a, some basis for them at all. And so we accept unreservedly that Advocate Brassy thought there was some merit in the charges. And do we need to look any further back then? That's where you were. Advocate Brassy said you were, had a, a reasonable basis. And shouldn't we proceed from there on? Yes, I will. I'll Is that OK? Yeah. Um, Ms. Steinberg? Well, it's so, uh, then the ch so the charges were then drawn. Uh, and then what happened next? after the charges were withdrawn, and then you had set up the disciplinary inquiry uh, yeah, I chairman under former Chief, Chief Justice Nkobo? Yes. OK, let's go on. Sorry, where we were at is you asked the former Chief Justice, did he accept the appointment? 
we, we discussed it that vaccine. The, so, so one of the, so that was, that was the first clarity that needed to be sought. The second clarity that needed to be sought was in relation to the purchasing of the equipment. So in the evidence, Advocate Grizzly and the team discovered on page 448 to 461 that, and I'll move, I'll move as fast as that because of yeah, time, no, that's fine. 448 to 461, that um, <coughs> Mr. Pillay purchased equipment of, in, of intelligence and covert nature, which equipment cannot be purchased for, by an institution like SARS for the purposes that has been raised about, about the mandate. So, so there was a request, I mean, there was a, then a point that the, the, the allegation must be, must be sorted out. So if we look into, into, um, Okay, I, I'm just a bit uh, wary of going on to that because it's the subject of criminal charges that are still pending. So I, I, I know, I understand you say that there is, as I say, Advocate Brassi says, he felt that there was a basis for all of the charges, including that one. Okay. But I'd rather not go into the details of that because it's the you know these criminal proceedings are still going on in relation to that, and uh, I don't want to interfere in any way. Sorry, Mr. Willis, can I just ask you, sir? Yes. Yeah. No, yeah. yeah. May, may I just ask a question at this point? Um, you know, I, I'm curious about uh, the fact that the purchase of this equipment is said to be unlawful. Yesterday, I read from a memorandum uh, that was written on the 1st of September 2016, in which Mr. Jürgen Mundi gets approval from uh, Chief Officer Klengani Matabula to purchase these, this type of equipment. Now, I'm confused as to why the same SARS that says it's unlawful in this case now approves it a couple of years later. Not Council, is that exactly the same equipment? It's a s similar type. It's for the same purpose. It's for the same purpose. It's, 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 it's safe houses, surveillance. It's the same type of equipment. I think I'll take the heat from Jecha. Firstly, to say that, remember, when this work was done, decisions were made by Advocate Martin Grace. He made decisions at the time with the information that was before him. And, 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 and I think probably the judge goes there to say, as, as we question this, it's like we're questioning his whatever which decision he made at the time. I'm not aware of equipment that can be interpreted as illegal being bought. And of course, if there is anyone who has bought equipment that are illegal, must, 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 uh, you know, must, must, must explain why would, why would you buy the equipment that are illegal. But I'm not, I don't, I'm not assuming anything. I don't know. I haven't seen the, uh, the equipment. I haven't seen anything. But I agree that uh, the, the charges that are here, which were preferred by Advocate Brazley preferred them. Him and his team were willing to go and defend them before the, the, the former chief justice. And of course, Mr. Pillay had all the right as well, like any other employee, to also defend himself. So in, in as far as being contradictory to the, to the, to the um, criminal case, I think I, think I, I... I suppose I'm asking a little a different question here. That you are part of the leadership of this organization. And I'm, I'm really asking you to account that the same organization that charges people on this basis in 2015. Uh, the following year proves exactly the same conduct. I I'm asking you to explain how that comes about. Suppose that the unfairness is that I am even more careful to conclude that Somebody has approved equipment that are illegal. I haven't seen them. All I'm saying is, if there is an illegal conduct in SARS and is brought before management, management has got a responsibility to make sure that people account to that allegation. So if there is such an allegation, like you are saying, 
and it's broad, and indeed it is illegal, because I don't even know what, what kind of, and the question is whether it's exactly the same equipment as something else. But I can't, I can't say whatever. If it, was, if, you, if it was brought to me, I didn't do anything, and I did something for somebody else, that's, that's different. But I, I'm, I, I was not even aware that there are equipment that are illegal. That so I were you not aware that uh, the, 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 the tactical task team got approval to buy all sorts of equipment for this kind of um, um, uh, investigation into the illicit economy, the same type of equipment? Not at all. Not at all. How, how do you account for the fact that, that in 2015 it's considered by SARS illegal and in 2016 it's not? I don't know whether SARS considered anything, really. And that's what I'm saying. If it was brought to us, and we looked at it and said it is okay, it's different to say, but before you said it's not okay, now you're saying it's, it's okay. Personally, I've never, I've never, I was not aware that there are approval of equipments for whatever purpose, I've never seen them. I'm hearing it for the first time as you are mentioning it. So it might not be fair to say, but you have done nothing with this one and the other one. And, and because if, if transactions, I mean, if, if things are happening in the organization, they must be brought before management for them to make a call. I'm not aware of that approval. Well, I think I'll ask uh, Mr. Matabuli yes. tomorrow when he comes, because he is the person who approved it. But it is curious, yes. and it is why I started and, and really still haven't got an answer to the question. What was the legal basis for suspending Mr. Pillay in the first place? <coughs> who actually said that what they were doing was unlawful? Because no one has ever actually given us a satisfactory answer to that. And in fact, SARS seems to think, as of last year, it's not unlawful. Yeah, and, and I thought I responded, maybe. No, no, before, I, when he was suspended, you didn't have Mr. Brassi. Yeah, you suspended because there were allegations of possible misconduct. You then go and investigate, <coughs> and the investigation might come and say there is nothing, and the investigation might come and say there is something. No, but I'm but asking you why it was considered unlawful. Finish, just let it's not answering my question, no, no, George. We'll let him finish not answering your question, then we'll go back to the question if necessary. <laughs> <laughs> if he's not answering the question. <laughs> Miss, please, I don't want... Uh, this is not a show here. Please, this is a serious commission. And we're getting into a different debate. Agreed. So the debate is... There is a, there is a commission by Sikakani, Advocate Sikakani. It comes with allegations. We go to council and say, council, guide us on what to do. Council looks at this thing and say, you may suspend pending an investigation. And we do exactly that. No, we you go, don't. But let me finish. <laughs> uh, sorry, sorry that I'll say, let me finish. Because Thank you. Please finish. Please finish. So we do exactly that. So we suspend the colleagues. We institute an investigation. And we even go a step further, we, we institute an investigation by a different set of eyes, if you like, to say, look into what Sikakane has already said, but do the investigation. They go and interview over 30 people, and they come back and say, we are concluding the same thing that Sikakane has concluded, and here are our grounds. We say to them, guys, go further, get an independent chair who must test the allegation. And they go and get Justice Ngobo, who was willing the chair to chair the to chair the hearing? Now, the argument about the legalities, like now I was showing two memos and, and their views about the two memos, and I can show more other things that there will be two views about those things, and that is the purpose of a hearing. The job of a, I mean, the duty of a, of, of a disciplinary hearing is to allow the accused an opportunity to explain what the employer thinks is discrepancies. Uh, you haven't actually answered her question. So, but we've been through this, yeah. and because her question was before you had gone to see Brassy, et cetera, uh, and, and all this disciplinary thing had been investigated. Mr. Pillay was suspended. So let's not look at what happened after. No. No, Maybe let, me no let me finish. You had gone to Mr. Brassy to ask if you were suspended. Mr. Brassy hadn't advised you on whether it was these things were lawful or not. He had just told you about suspension and you must give a hearing before. That's all he had said. And he was suspended. 
Now the question has always been, and you told me now, you, now you, just now you told me you didn't rely on Sikhikani. Now I hear that Sikhikani is relied on in some way, Advocate Sikhikani. The question is simply, and we, on what basis did anyone think it was unlawful? Did you have an opinion of some kind? And I think you've said no. All we've had is Advocate Sikhikani, I'm repeating myself, saying I think it's unlawful. Fair enough, he might be right, he might be wrong. But you didn't rely on him. So that's the question that Council keeps coming back to, and I think we should move on uh, yeah. from that, because we've been through it so many times. Yeah, yeah, if you want another chance to yeah, answer it, it will, please do. Yeah, it will be... It will be let, let, me, let me clarify, because I think that's... We relied on Advocate Skakani for the suspension. Well, I thought you said you didn't. No, 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 let me... Let me make the point. After the suspension, we then asked a team to investigate the charges. I understand. So we did not rely on Mr. Skakani for the charges. I know. We've heard that's that. The, that's the difference I'm trying but to But for make. the suspension, you really yes. say you relied on Advocate yes. Sikakani. After we got an opinion from counsel. But you ignored the critique or rebuttal that Mr. Pillay had provided in relation to what uh, Advocate Sikakani had written. Not quite. So when, when, Mr. when Mr. Pile was suspended for the second time, he was given six weeks to, to give a rebuttal, if you like, to, 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 to convince SARS why. We're still on the first suspension, isn't it? We're on the first suspension, but the questions around the legality yes. of that related to the first suspension. Yes. All I'm saying is before we suspended him for the second, before we, we finalized the last suspension, he was given six weeks to convince us why he should not be suspended. What is accepted is that on that first meeting where they said the two of them and say, we're well, about to suspend you now, and, and, and then he gave reason, they said the reasons are not enough. The document that you're referring to, like I said, the one that they refused to look at, it happened before, it was not during the suspension. It happened before the suspension. On the day of the suspension, that document was not there. What was there was the conversation. Then the court said to us, you didn't give him enough time to convince you why he should not be suspended. And that is when we provide more time. But still, before the suspension, you had Sikakane's report, yes. as well as a critique on Sikakane's report. And so when you say, because you have now done a full swing and said you've placed reliance on Sikakane, and I'm simply just trying to understand, when you place reliance on Sikakane this time, did you take into account the document that had preceded the suspension, the 34 pages that uh, from what council had read, were simply discarded. Okay. So Sikakani comes with a report. We go and seek counsel on what to do. And counsel says, you can suspend Mr. Pile. We get into a meeting. We suspended him. He takes us to court. Court says, you must revoke that suspension because you do not give him enough time to respond to you. And then we come back, and then we give him enough time to respond. So they, I don't know why is, why is it called a swing. I said the suspension happened on the strength of the Sikakani. The disciplinary charges was not relied from Sikakani, was relied from an independent investigator. Yeah, look, I think we should move on now, because the, uh, Mr. Kushler asks you, you've got, if you now say you relied on the Sikakani report, did you also... Why did you not read the 34-page response to the Sikakani? Why did you say, well, I'm going to rely on what Sikakani says, but I don't want to hear what the response is? That was the question. But I think we're moving on now, if we can. And now we're getting to, I think, Just, sorry. I think we're getting to where the disciplinary proceedings have started. And, uh, and we accept that there was, in Mr. Brassie's view, right or wrong, he felt there was a basis for that. What happened to the disciplinary proceeding? Judge, just, just one thing before we go on. Um, you know, the, the trouble with not reading uh, what people want to say is that then you don't know the other side of the story. Okay. So I, I've, just, uh, I've just checked uh, that 34-page document, and Mr. Pillay actually tries to explain exactly what Mr. Kachler was getting at. And I, I just want to highlight that. He says that... 
the conclusion that this is uh, Advocate Sikakani reached about the covert nature of the NRG. Uh, in reaching that conclusion, the panel made three errors. Uh, the first one is that it relied on untested allegations from the media. But the second two, I think, go to what Mr. Kachler was probing. Said it conflated the unit as was contemplated in 2007 and the unit that came to be after it became clear that the NIA would no longer host the contemplated unit. The two were not the same. And the third is that the panel did not distinguish between discrete investigations and the covert gathering of intelligence, which is aimed at national security. And that belongs, the latter belongs in the realm of the NIA. So in fact, a different prima facie reading of that evidence was actually provided but disregarded. And that's the point I'm raising Thank before you. we go on. Thank you. My, my comment there is that the, so Mr. Pile gave a document to Mr. Moyani disregarded the document. The process of suspension was different from the document. And, and maybe Mr. Moyani will explain why he disregarded the document and he disregarded those facts. But for the purposes of convincing why you should not be suspended, the document was not brought to before the, the before you, yeah, before before us, uh, and in this case before Mr. Brazy. Well, <coughs> the, uh, I'm not sure what you. It was it it was given to Mr. Moyani, and yeah. he said I don't want to read it. Yeah, so but I understand. He also said please don't tell any of the exco because yeah. they might get influenced by it. Yeah, there was some issues about the document, which is yeah. all I'm saying is in the when we give you a chance in the suspension. Yeah. You bring all your facts. I'm saying those facts were not considered by Brazy because they were not brought as part of the facts that, that must be considered. For yeah, now he, you say Mr. Brassi even didn't see that document. No. So no one saw that document because it went to Mr. Muyani. He said, don't Mr. Don't, this is a secret between you and me, and uh, I'm not reading it, but don't let anyone else read it. That's the long and the short of it. When and you say you, that you didn't see it even. No. When did you get to hear of that document, of its existence? Oh. I can't say in specific times. So, so, so sometimes in the media you'll hear that there was a document. I remember there was a city press that says there is a document like that. And then there are letters that said, no, I never gave somebody a document. So there was a, there was a noise about the document. But, but the important part for, for us, like the judge is summing up, is that Mr. Moyani, Mr. Pillay went to Mr. Moyani as the, ball, as the manager at the time and say, I've got this document that wants to rebut the allegation. But that was before we get into the suspension and, and all those kind of things. And Mr. Moyani says, don't, don't, I'm not going to read it. Don't give it to exco members. That is the conversation they have, the two of them. On the other side, we go on with the suspension. And later on, we send to Mr. Pile, Mr. Pile, we intend to suspend you. Tell us we should not suspend you. And for some reason, he didn't bring that document to convince the suspension. So, so in the consideration of the suspension, the document was not. It, does that concern you now in retrospect, that the suspension which you carried out on the strength of the Kakane report, had actually ig ignored the rebuttal, the rebuttal on the Skakane, of, of the of the Skakane report. Not quite. Remember. So, if so, no moment to you that no, there was a rebuttal. There was a rebuttal. Let me, let me. So, once you reach an, a labor relations side, if you if you reach an ER side, and we say to you, we intending to suspend you. We give you an opportunity to bring any document that you think will convince us. If you and your manager at some point had a conversation and gave each other a document there, if it's not brought there, unfortunately it can't be considered. And, and I, I do not know, and I can't, uh, uh, Mr. Pillay had led legal, legal representation, so I do not know why he decided not to bring it there. I can't, I can't answer that. But all I'm saying is that if you don't bring whatever evidence to convince us why we should not suspend you, there is no way that you'll know about the suspension. Sorry, I'm getting confused on that. You were told to give extra time yeah. so that he could rebut. Yeah. And he seeks to rebut. No, 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 good. No. No, let me, I'll clarify it. He was he got the document, he was suspended, I think, on the 5th of December. Is that right? And off he went to the Labour Court, and I think on the 18th of December, the Labour Court said, and with reference to that document, you didn't give him a chance to be heard, and in fact, you stopped him being heard. That's what the Labour Court said. And so you went back, and in January, I think it was, 
on about the, I can't remember the date, but then you wrote a long letter to him, to Mr. Pillay, saying, here are the allegations, do you want to respond? And, uh, and he was, I don't know if he did respond, uh, uh, Ms. Steinberg, that's the one part that's gone out of my mind. But he did yes. respond, and he was suspended again on the 21st of January. Yes. Is that right? Yes. Those are the facts. Yes. The okay, only I just point wanted... is that in the response, he did not include that. So that conversation took place before he was suspended between him and Mr. But he did seek to, he did seek to rebut. Not with that. Yes, yes. he sought to rebut with, with information. Is there. Yes. And, and the lawyers who were advising us looked at the rebuttal and said it still doesn't answer the question. And that's where the suspension okay. is. Are we able to now get to the uh, disciplinary? We are, Judge. Thank you. Ms. Steinberg, I just have one question. We're not, Judge. <laughs> 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 Mr. Lebello, you told us that you are not part, you are not in the meeting uh, during which Mr. Pile was, was suspended. It was Mr. Moyane and your, your boss, um, the chief officer. How do you know that Mr. Pile didn't have the document on hand and asked again? You know, and, and I mean, so then asked Mr. 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 Moyane to consider it at the time when he was suspended, suspended for the first time because you were not there. Yeah, remember, after the suspension, obviously they briefed me that this is what happened, and he gave the reasons we decided to suspend. And then we went to the labor court, we came back, and we, given, we gave him another opportunity. But to, to answer to your question, they briefed me about what happened. So I know from their briefing that the document was not submitted yet. Okay. And mm -hmm. even when we gave no time, it was not submitted. And it might be for some legal advice or something like that. What they didn't tell you is that the document had, in fact, long been with them, with at least with the, with the commissioner. Yeah, that's why I'm, I'm explaining that that is a conversation between him and the commissioner as a manager, as a line manager. But the process yeah. runs its own course. So you must decide whether you want to bring the same conversation you're having with your manager into the process or not. And, and that decision you can make. Excuse me for a moment. I think I must go. Do you say you were briefed after that uh, words, and they told you about this document, Ms. No, Kamala? No. And no, they, they briefed me on what happened in the suspension. That but did they tell you about this document? No. Did you still not know about this document? No. Did neither Ms. Kamala nor Mr. Moyani say Mr. Pile wanted to give us this, this document? No, I've never seen the document. I heard about the document sometime in the media or somewhere, but I've never seen the document. Did it concern you that there was, in the media, reference to this document? It had an impact on the employee relations decisions that needed to be taken, and, it, and you had never been furnished uh, with it. Yeah, remember, when, when, we, when we gave Mr. Pillay six weeks to provide reasons for those long list of charges, that's where he decides what he puts to motivate. That's the decision that he makes. So, so you might have a conversation with this boss and say, I'm thinking about this, thing, but once you open the, the, the ER process, if he doesn't bring the document, he doesn't bring the document. And I wouldn't, be worried, I, I wouldn't necessarily be worried because I, did, I didn't show the document, so I don't know whether the document was rebutting what was there or was not rebutting what was there. Because the document was even written before the, the charges were, pro, were, were, were put together. Anyway, so we know that the, uh, then that from this that the suspension took place. Mr. Muyani <coughs> knew that there was a rebuttal. You say he didn't tell anyone. Uh, he refused to read it. He refused his ex go to see it. He didn't even show it to the people when the disciplinary uh, charges were being drawn. Didn't disclose it then. And it was never disclosed to anyone. That's, is that what you're telling us? Yes, as far as I know. Okay, that's fine. Let's get on to the disciplinary then. Maybe the last point I want to make before we go to the disciplinary is the... And just to, just to remind myself here that I'm, I'm here to say that the process that we followed, I want to convince the commission that I was, if there was a, I was not, it, it was not a page, I was not, I was not part of the page. If there were errors that were made, there were errors that were made, but it was not a page, and I want to I convince the well, commission. Well, you're saying a different thing. It may have been a purge, but you say if it was a purge, it wasn't my purge. No. <laughs> That's right. I was not, I was not part of that. But, but the important thing is just to refer the commission to page 553. Uh, sorry, is this now file 2? File 2, yeah. Will you give me a moment? Uh, what, what page, Mr. Labella? Five five two. And in summary the the in summary the 
the, the page talks to, at least in my belief at the time, that... Well, let's just tell the commissioners what it is no so problem. that they can follow. Uh, this is a letter from uh, Mashiana Mudli Munama, attorneys, um, and it was written to Cliff Decker Hoffmeyer attorneys, and it concerns Mr. Pillay and the South African Revenue Service, um, and it's dated January the 12th, 2015. So, so the, let, the, the letter refers to uh, so, the, so the letter refers to a number of meetings. This is one of the meetings where I was sent and asked to meet with the legal representatives of Mr. Pile because Mr. Pile wants to, to resign. And the point I'm making is that my understanding it, with all the evidence that I had was that Mr. Pile all the time wanted to resign. And, and this meeting was a meeting in Santin, uh, chaired by uh, Mr. Hailey, who was the president, uh, the former president's uh, lawyer, where Mr. Pile came there and we met, and he wanted to, he, I was told to go and fetch a resignation because he wants to resign, he doesn't want to be part of this, of this thing. So we went there, and when you got there, there was different views that meeting didn't come right. So, so the letter there is in response to that, to that meeting. And I also want to refer... Just a, so what is the relevance of that? The relevance of that, Judge, is, is, is as opposed to have been pushed, he requested to resign, at least from where I was sitting. I'm just, I'm just getting that to, so that I... They can just be given a moment. What would have constituted being pushed? I remember I said that I wanted to explain the role I played, of which explanation wants to say that if there was, there was a plan like the judge is saying, I was not part of that plan. Okay. So the allegations that continue to say I was part of a plan they are not correct. I'm just showing my role okay. and the innocence of that role, if you like. Okay. So you, that's right. Now, so what has this letter got to do with? The, there is a letter that indicating that he wanted to resign already by January. Yes. Okay. We've got that. And there was another. There was another meeting where he wrote another letter, where he also said I want to resign, and he put conditions to the resignation. I know. And we let's take that, get through that quickly. There were some discussions. Even the former, uh, the. The current president yeah. got involved in some of the discussions. He was the deputy president at the time. <clears throat> a resolution was being sought. Uh, I want to know what happened to the disciplinary proceedings. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, but so, I so, understand so, there were there were discussions yes. about resigning quite an early. And, and from from time to time, when those discussions happen, we stop we stop processes right. all the time because okay. there were big people who were getting involved in the discussion. And of course, the last one was was when. There was a meeting in Cape Town with the former deputy minister where the resignation happened. And I was asked to, to do the media thing and, and stuff like that. I think that's the point I'm making is, is from all this time, I thought, and my understanding was that, you know, there is a talk that the two of them want to solve this thing and one wants to resign. And for that, was, I, I, I administered a document between him and Mr. Uh, 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 Pete Richer where he was given a settlement of 18 months. And all the time until that point, I always thought, even if you look at the settlement and you look at the condition of the settlement, it looked like you know, a settlement of, of people who are, not, who are not fighting, if you like. And, and at, no, at no point was I ever asked to put pressure on Mr. Pile. We spoke at, when we were at the CCMA, and there was never, there was never a problem. Okay. So can, the, I, can, the, I just the, the okay. can I just clarify? Can I just clarify? Yeah. We'll still settle down. Uh, are you <laughs> wanting you? us to draw an inference from these documents? that he wasn't pushed or pressurized to resign? Yes. I, I'm afraid I can't draw that inference from these documents. Uh, uh, because, uh, he, because he offered his resignation is not proof of the fact that he didn't feel pressured to resign. Yeah, all I'm saying is from, remember, 
the, the judge is correct that you are not saying there's no other things. You are saying the role you played as the head of ER was a role that was, if you like, innocent under the circumstances. And, and, and let, me just, let me just finish. So I'm saying, because I was part of the facilitation of the resignation meeting, some of them, it was at that time that I even spoke to him and he'll tell me that, look, I'm 60 years, I'm whatever years, I want to leave, I can't taint my name. So all this time, that was, that was understood. If you don't take the inference, I think it's fair, but I'm making the inference. But if you don't, if you don't take it, I think it's fair that you, you don't have to take it. Hence, hence I asked Eliam Silbello, what would have constituted being pushed from a job? I mean, you're an employee relations expert. What, what are the circumstances that must exist for someone to consider himself being pushed from a job? Let, let, me, let me explain the fundamentals of this process. There are two important fundamentals. One is that the, the Sikakani panel investigation was not instituted, okay, was instituted by Mr. Pile. So it, has, it had good intention, if you like. The second one is that we come back and then institute an independent investigation. And an independent investigation come and say, they are charges. And then we say to them, go and get an independent, like a retired judge in this case, go and get an independent presiding officer who must listen to this thing. And that is the degree at which at a labor relation, that's the process of independence. And, and me having run, having run so many disciplinaries, when a matter seems to be contaminated, if you like, this is the process we'll follow. We make sure that we allow, we appoint lawyers, we give them sole powers, and we make sure that we get an independent chairperson. Uh, but look, I think I'm going to interrupt you. You know, that, that wasn't the question that was asked. And I've told you before, in your own interest, please listen. Don't try and answer it too quickly. Listen and make sure you understand the question. Otherwise, it's unfair on you because one might eventually say, look, Mr. Labello doesn't want to answer questions. And I think the problem at the moment is you didn't listen to the question from Mr. Kushler. Mr. Kushler's question was not in relation to this, as I understand it. What are the circumstances in which a person can be considered to be pushed? Am I right, Mr. Kushler? That's correct. General. I'm saying, I mean, you're an employee relations expert. At least that's uh, how you put yourself out to when you started. And I'm really just wanting, taking that into account and trying to understand from your experience what are the circumstances that would have to be exist for someone to justifiably say, I'm pushed? Uh, it's a difficult question because circumstances differ. But normally, there will be a concoction of charges. So, so you'll come and, and imagine charges just to put a person outside. And you come with, a, if you like, a kankaroo investigation with a predetermined outcome. And then you said your own chairperson who must come with the outcome. Because normally when people are pushed, they are pushed. There, there is an outcome. Then we say we do this. And, and you realize that I've got no choice here. You know, this chairperson is a friend of whoever. You can see, you can see when, when that thing is said. And that's why maybe in my, in my false response to your question, misunderstanding, thinking that you're talking about this one, I was just saying that the, the pillars we have put, uh, because it's prima facie, you need to be seen to be fair. So the pillars we have put, we wanted to, to show that we are fair, that we want an independent outcome. If, let's say, for instance, we got a presiding officer that is within SAR, for instance, and is junior to the commissioner, and this person is a deputy, you can see that this person reported to the commissioner, the commissioner can, can influence. I think the biggest thing normally is the final person who's going to make the decision. How independent is that person? Sorry, the only Would point, you add? The only point that, that um, Mr. Cutler's point came from and counsel is he made point saying the offer to resign is indicative that he wasn't pushed and it was voluntary resignation. I don't think we've got sufficient to draw that inference. I think that's the only point where... Anyway, let's move on. Let's, move on. let's move on now. It's for, we'll decide in due course mm. whether the facts show that he was pushed or not pushed. Definitely. Judge, let's move on. Can judge, I? just a housekeeping matter. Yeah, uh, it's getting it's, late. It's 25 past one. Can I just hear 
the answer to my question, what happened to the disciplinary <laughs> proceedings? <laughs> uh, Judge, get let's, that let's and then take move on. Let's you want take to do that, it later? Let's take that question, but uh, we have a witness due it too, and I'm just wondering if we shouldn't ask the secretary just to do the courtesy yes. of letting her know that it's very unlikely she's going to be here, she's going to be heard too. We're going to want to break for lunch at some point, and then uh, given the number of files, I suspect there's quite a lot more evidence that, um, that Mr. Labello well, wants to put before. Well, is there, Mr. Labello? I think that we know what happened now. Mr. Brassi, yeah. you say, drew charges. You feel that, uh, that there was justification for the charges. Mr. Pillay uh, resigns in their discussions about resignation. Eventually, he resigns on the eve of the disciplinary proceedings. Is that right? And uh, there was just uh, uh, one was leading up to the disciplinary proceedings before he resigned. Is that right? Correct. And what happened to the? There's another opinion from Mr. Brassy there. Yes. He tells me. Can you just see that opinion, and then we move on? I think. I think. Uh, huh? Can I can I ask the secretary just to? Yes. Uh, would you do? You know who they are, and you can contact them. Thank you. Um, what, how long do you think we? I don't think we're going to be a lot longer, are we? Yeah. I think we, I really think that we're near, I know we, we had a lot of conversations, and I know you wanted to show us that you personally felt that you had proper grounds for what you did, and we've heard what you said. So, is that okay, Mr. Lovello? We're not going to yeah. be too long, are we? Yeah, there's only one point. Uh, so, so, on the other matters, we're not going to move faster. I suppose they're not as complex, if you like, as this one. So... The only point I want to make, Judge, was in response in particular to Mr. Pile when he was here, the issue about the settlement, that we seem to have violated the settlement. SAR seemed to have violated the settlement because it agreed that it's not going to raise any or, or all investigations, uh, at least in his understanding, including criminal, will not, will not proceed. And, and I was just listening. I thought there is a missing... A little bit of a missing link there. Uh, so, so what what happened? Uh, is I'm sorry. I like things logically and chronologically. Can I, for the last time, I'm going <coughs> to ask, know what happened in the lead up to the disciplinary proceedings? Now, I'm not going to tolerate anyone moving away. I want it, and we're going to move on. Is that okay? It's then we'll come me, to Judge. your point after the resignation. Do Do you want to hear from me what Mr. No, Brass? I, want, yeah, I know that Mr. Brass he gave another opinion. I want all the uh, information that was available at that time. And if we're dealing with it, I don't want to take just little bits of it. Let's put on record all the information that was there. Because let me tell you, I've, see, you know, I've spoken to Mr. Brassi. I've seen his opinions at your request that I should. I would have done so anyway. But and I remember Mr. Brassi, leading up to that, said there is not a strong enough case to go on with. Is my right? Something to that effect. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, just finding it, but right on the eve of the disciplinary hearing, uh, Mr. Brassy gave his final opinion to me, and he says uh, it's an advice on evidence, <coughs> basically. And uh, he, he recommends in that opinion, this is dated 29 April 2015, just before the disciplinary hearing was about to take place. And he says, the opinion starts, yesterday we recommended to our client, SARS, that of the three sets of charges currently being pressed against Mr. Pillay, the charges concerned with the so-called rogue unit should be held in abeyance. Our advice was premised on the fact that the evidence, so far as we've been able to gather it, is far from conclusive on these charges, and the witnesses who might be called to substantiate the case were proving to be uncooperative. In response, our client, represented by Mr. Luther Labello, has instructed us that all three charges should be pressed together, and we will happily submit to such instructions. What follows is what, what Mr. Brassy describes as a very brief advice on evidence. And he says, um, the documentary evidence on the activities of the rogue unit 
is, as presently advised, thoroughly unsatisfactory. Um, and so on. So he, he tries to persuade SARS to continue with the other two charges, but to drop the rogue unit charges, but he's told, no, go ahead on all the charges. And to add to that, I have carefully looked through your file, and I see no signed witness statement, not one. Well, anyway, we'd miss have no argument on that. That's what Mr. Brassie said, said that he advised you that. What do you say about that? Uh, um, if it was brought to me, because I'm just, I'm just I think it, it, it was brought to me because yesterday I asked, I don't know if it was part of the file, was, was supposed to be part of the things I was supposed to explain. Oh, so get, I saw, yeah. yeah, I saw, and I requested that, can you please submit what is related to what Mr. Priestley said, and I didn't, I didn't see. So it's difficult for me to really respond, Af. Well, look at it over lunch, and then we can respond. No, I think fine. we get a break for a little while. Uh, yeah, if you I, don't, Ms. Steinberg, we're going to break for a little yeah. while, and then sure. Uh, that document, I'm not sure where that came from. Did it, uh, Mr. Brassie send it? No. No, this anyway, was part of SARS documents. This is part of SARS documents. Okay. We're going to break for how long? Should we make it a bit shorter? Three quarters sure. of an hour. Should we resume at quarter past two? Okay. That's well, three you. quarters of an Mr. hour. Bella, we'll come back at oh, quarter past two. Thank you. Good afternoon, Ms. McCullough. Good afternoon, Judge. <coughs> uh, will you affirm that the evidence you give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? If so, will you say I do? Um, afternoon, Ms. McCullough. Um, you came to the judge a little while back saying you, you, you would like to give evidence, and I'm wondering from your side uh, what that evidence is that you'd like to share. Um, thank you. Um, the first meeting that I had w um, with the judge was when he came to meet with us as a group, as members of the EXCO, to invite us to support and participate in, in the inquiry. Um, so that was the first meeting. Uh, my second meeting was the day after we had the Treasury authorities um, testifying at the commission. One of the officials from uh, National Treasury spoke about how the current SARS Exco was destroying the, the institution, meaning SARS, and that we were incompetent. And I think either he implied or what he expressly said that we were corrupt. I took serious exception to that. And up until that point, I'd actually made a decision not to watch um, the proceedings here. I wanted some distance from it because I found it to be a distraction. But I, when I heard that, and I heard it in, on my way home in the car on 702, I got very upset. I sent a text to the acting commissioner, Mark Kingan, and told him that I took exception to what he said, and that I was actually minded to speak to the minister about how we were being spoken about, uh, particularly as some of us had only been here about 14, 15 months. I've been at SARS since the 3rd of July, 2017. So that's the first thing. So, and I told Mark that I was also minded to speak to the commission to set the record straight because I felt it was extremely offensive, what the things that were being said, because I felt that whoever was making those statements didn't even know who the people, some of the people he was talking, he or she was talking about. Um, I don't know whether th this gentleman even would even recognize me in public, so I took exception to that. Um, I then was advised to call Giorgio to arrange a meeting with the judge, and that was and the judge kindly accepted. When I came to speak to the judge, my ob I had one objective: to tell him about who I was, my qualifications, and my experience. Um, I told him that I'd worked at Bowman's and that I was a, that I was a tax lawyer there. I'd been a partner at Bowman's since the 1st of March 2008. That I had extensive experience and also that I had the academic qualifications that qualified me for the job. And I also said to the judge that I was distressed by the things that were being said about us. And I also pointed out to the judge that I'd only been at SARS since the 3rd of July 2017. The two things that the judge said was that if the SARS executive 
wants to set the record straight, they must come and make submissions just like everybody else at the public hearing. And I was also um, asked to convey a message to my ex-school colleagues that we must be prepared to do that. I went to my office, sent an email to my, to my ex-school colleagues that this is the expectation from the judge. So that was the end of it. So my objective at that second meeting, where it was just the two hours with the judge, was to set the record straight about who I was. And I left it at that. Then the next thing I knew, I got an email to come and meet with the evidence leader, and that was yourself, to come and talk about the kind of evidence I would want to give um, at the commission, because the expectation was that all EXCO members would have to come and testify in public. And when I met with you, I made it very clear that I was confused, because, to be honest, I hadn't been here long enough. And I also pointed out that, you know, I'm not everybody's cup of tea. I get along with some people. I don't get along with certain people. And I also explained, and in fact, I think I even said this to the judge, and I recall that my parting shot was that I'm having a midlife crisis, judge, and I'm going to enjoy it. So if I'm going to be having fights with people, some people I'll make unhappy. I'll apologize in certain instances, but I don't expect everybody to like me. And I think I, the, that was the gist of what I also said to you. And I told you about two difficult relationships, because you did ask me who it is that I didn't get along with, and I told you about two people. It was the commissioner, who's been suspended, and a former colleague who's subsequently resigned, um, Jonas Makwak. I told you about that. And also, at the end, I told you why I had a difficult relationship with them. And I also explained, at the end, that I don't know that this is, and I think my words were, I'm, I'm sorry, this is not juicy enough. And you said, you said, look, we'll decide. So I was surprised when I got the email last week asking me to come and testify. Because uh, the email didn't tell me what kind of information would be required of me, what kind of documentation would be required of me, and I'm still confused as to why I'm here. But I'm willing to cooperate. So any questions that you would like to ask me about the stuff that you and I discussed that particular day, I'm happy to discuss it. Let me just make it <coughs> clear. Do you, do you wish to give evidence or don't you? Uh, judge, to the extent that my relationship, my difficult relationship with those two individuals has, has had an impact or sheds light on how things operated, I'm happy to give it. Well, that's uh, fine. I'm not, I don't think it's within my discretion to say no to you. Um, this is not about me. After all, it's about the organization. And, and if, I've, if my role here and my presence here is relevant to the inquiry, then I'm perfectly willing to. Yeah, um, no, no, I just want to get it clear, though. I don't want you to feel that you're under compulsion to give evidence, because you're not. Uh, you did come to see me, as you correctly say, and I said to you, well, it's no good coming and telling me this in, in confidence, confidence, as it were. It's yeah. out there in the public. And uh, as I understood it, you wanted to give evidence. And I'd also, you're quite correct, it was about a month into this commission or so, I came to Exco. I attended a meeting of Exco, and I said to Exco, look, the organization for and in a number of respects, is under investigation. Mm. Uh, Exco, who is the management of this organization, I would expect that they would wish to assist me to tell me what's going on in the organization, make recommendations as to what should be fixed, etc. Well, uh, you were, and thank you very much, by the way, you were the first one to come forward. And, and you did come forward because things had been said by Treasury, I think it was Treasury or Judge Davis or whatever. Fair enough, but if you don't want to give evidence, you must tell me, I don't want to force you. It's up to you entirely, you must make the choice. Look, uh, Judge, one of the things I also mentioned to you is that my reputation is important to me. Yes. Um, I didn't grow up in a rich family and I think I've worked very hard to get to where I have. And my name is all I have. And I also told you that I have a three-year-old who I'm hoping that one day will be literate enough to be able to read papers. And when my child reads about me, when that day comes, I want her to be proud of the woman who raised her. And if I can ensure that here, in this room, and by being truthful and honest, I'm perfectly willing to do that. That's the first thing. Secondly, there's a whole country out there that's watching what we do. And I'm the chief of enforcement. My job is made ever more difficult by the distrust. I can tell you a story. This year, we had a visibility campaign regarding outstanding returns. We went to all over the country, and one of the locations that I went to help distribute pamphlets was in Limpopo. There's a taxpayer 
who was rude to one of the people that the team, the members of the team who was distributing, who said, "Why should I file a tax return? You know, you don't you pay refunds over to the Guptas, and then you and then you come here just because now you can't meet your targets. You come here and you want to collect. That makes my job very difficult." No, I understand. <coughs> I understand that. So I, I think the upshot of it is that, Judge, to the extent that I can help, I'm here. Okay. Well, that's fine. If you're willing to be here, that's I appreciate it very much. But I think that uh, one must understand that when one comes here, if a witness wants to come and is willing to come and talk to us, there may be other questions that we would have as well. You understand that? And I you're understand. a member of EXCO. Yes. And I think there are questions that we would like to ask about how the members of EXCO see SARS at the moment. So if you don't mind, uh, please tell us what you want to say about what uh, Treasury or Judge Davis or whoever it was said about you. Tell us what you want to respond. And we, but we, I think that I would also like to know, if, I'm sure that maybe council does as well, about where's EXCO in all of this? We hear, we've had, what, 60 witnesses, 55. And uh, I've never heard from EXCO. I'm here. That's fine. Uh, I, th I think before we proceed, just so we don't get sidetracked, I, I mean, I don't know, advocate, if you've got questions for me, but I know that something was said about me, that I told someone to get out of my office. Yeah. I want to make it categorically clear that I did say that to that gentleman. That you? I did tell him to get out of my office. Yes. So, we, so we're talking about Mr. Dinath? Yes. I did tell him to get out. The important thing to note also, which I know wasn't mentioned, in, I didn't pick it up in the transcript, is that I was not alone with him in my office. There was um, Elise van, van Skalveig, who is my HR business partner. She was in that meeting. That's the first thing. So she witnessed the entire thing. I was firm with Yusuf because I felt that he really was pushing his luck with me. He was insisting that I give him a position which he said was his. And I had been told, firstly, that he didn't qualify for that role. He didn't have meet the qualifications. And to be honest with you, I didn't have any knowledge of the background because these were things that happened pr well in, 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 before I arrived and they had to do with the operating model and the restructuring. But he insisted when he came back from his, from, from suspension that he wanted that position because that was his. And I told him that I, I couldn't give him that position. Firstly, I had started interviewing people for that position, and those people that I started interviewing were already going for assessment. So we were too far in the process. That's the second thing. But the point is he didn't qualify for the position to begin with. And secondly, I wasn't the first one to, try to, uh, to, to interview people for that role. When I arrived at SARS in July, I remember getting a meeting request to go and conduct interviews, and it was for the same role. And my office manager and I decided that I couldn't participate in those interviews, and those things had to be canceled because, firstly, I needed to understand the role of the Fraud Investigations Division and what its mandate was and, how it would, and whether or not I actually was comfortable having them reporting to me. That was the first thing. And also, I, just, I needed to understand the business and whether or not I actually needed an executive. So that process was canned. And then we advertised the position internally. Certain people didn't qualify. Um, to, they didn't meet the requirements and they didn't, didn't get shortlisted. There was a whole big issue about the fact that certain people didn't get shortlisted. I don't know why those people expected to be shortlisted if they didn't meet the requirements. And eventually, I got to a point where I had a discussion with one of my ex co colleagues that, look, I'm not comfortable with how, with the interference in this process. Um, I don't want, if this person doesn't meet the requirements, I'm not comfortable with it. They'd been acting in this position, but I'm not comfortable with them being interviewed just because they went and complained that they were not shortlisted, and now all of a sudden they need to be interviewed. And I said, if, if that's the case, then I'm going to recuse myself. Even though I'm the head of the, like, the ultimate head of the unit, I'm not going to interview this person I don't, because I don't want to be participating in a process that I'm not comfortable with. Can I, can I just uh, clarify the... There, there, there are two concerns from yeah. uh, Mr. Dinath's part, yeah. uh, which were also confirmed by the anonymous witness early on. And perhaps you can just give us your view on them. Yeah. Which concerns were those, ma'am? Sorry? Uh, which concerns were those? I'll tell you now. Okay. Um, the first was that, and I, 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 as I recall, this is in his grievance letter, but I may be yeah, wrong. I've got a copy of the grievance letter, yeah. Um, he says that when Bain came to restore to restructure and redesign the model long before your time. Mm. Um, the understanding was, and in fact the practice followed in many cases, was that where your job description didn't change, mm. even if that position was elevated, as it was in his case, you wouldn't have to reapply for your job. Mm. And he cites a few examples where that happened. Mm. 
of people who were in a particular job, say senior manager, and it was decided that in fact that job warranted an executive position. Mm. So the, the job description didn't change, yeah. but the post was elevated with the same job description to that of executive. Now, um, he says that's exactly what happened, and the, the documents seem to show it, that Bain accepted that his job description should stay as it is, but that it would be translated into an executive position. Yeah. Now, he says other people didn't have to reapply for mm. those jobs. He then got suspended, mm. uh, came back and thought, well, other people didn't have to reapply for their jobs. I got unfairly suspended. I was told there was a, a sham investigation against me. Uh, that job is owing to me. And I come back and I'm told I can't even apply for it. And so the injustice continues. Yeah. That's number one, if perhaps you want to respond to that. I can respond to that. Please. In part. So in every, st every step that I took with regards to this process after I sort of assumed control of it, not the first set of interviews, I was always guided by my HRBP. So I didn't even know who Yusuf was, and at some point people were not even willing to sort of, I think people were afraid to even tell me why he'd been suspended. But I got guidance from my HRBP. If there was anything untoward in the process, they would have told me. I had no reason to distrust the advice that I got. To the point that we ended up interviewing people and sending them for assessments. I trusted the advice that I was getting from my HR guys. I wasn't putting pressure on anyone to proceed with the process regardless of anything. We, I understood that we could interview for that. And as I'm telling you now, I was told that he, didn't quite, he didn't, doesn't even meet the minimum requirements of the job. So I worked on the basis of advice that I got. So I understand and I know that he's said as much to me that that job was his and it was elevated, the job description hadn't changed. I cannot talk to that. I don't know the science behind HR and how grading of positions happens. I can only talk to my role in this. And my role was I, I needed to appoint somebody in that role uh, because that's it. And then we needed to make sure that the vacancy was filled because there is a funding constraint. But uh, throughout, I was guided by HRBP. And I'm assuming that, that whatever we did, and I have no reason to distrust the lady. Um, so far, she's kept me in line. Not that I would have wanted to get, to get out of line, but she's kept me in line. So if, there's, if Yusuf is of, is of the view that the advice that I received, which led to me making the decisions that I made, that um, is, is incorrect, I can't talk to that. I, I, took, I took the advice as I got it. But is it not worth now perhaps asking the questions as to whether perhaps you, you were incorrectly advised? I'm not saying you mm. were. Yeah. But before there's another case, uh, because um, Mr. Dinat says he's now going to uh, bring a case against SARS. Is it not yeah. worth exploring uh, well, the, certainly. the I think correctness he, I, of what he says since no, yeah. since no one's been appointed yet? Uh, you, well, there's a problem. We, were, we had made an offer to somebody and they wanted more money and we couldn't afford to pay them what they wanted. Well, that means an offer hasn't been accepted. Yeah. yeah. So I'm said I'm happy to look into it. If I've acted on incorrect advice, then I can only apologize. But like I said, I had no reason to doubt the advice that I was being given. Um, I don't think Elise had anything to gain from standing in Yusuf's way. Um, so I can talk like we, we, we can certainly look into it. And if there's a governance process that needs to be followed to make sure that he gets the position, then by all means it, it should be done. Look, I think in truth. There was a lot of confusion around Bain's new operating model mm. and the post created. Yeah. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if Elise was confused because most people were. Um, but the fact remains that uh, it, sh it seems that Mr. Dinath can show that in circumstances like his, people were elevated with their positions. So it would seem it's, it's, it's worth looking yeah. at, at whether what he says is correct. Absolutely. Uh, because my understanding is that, yes, there were instances where people didn't have to apply for those positions. They were just placed. But uh, certain people who didn't qualify for the positions or the job description sheets, then they had to apply. That's, that's, what I, that's how it's been explained to me in a manner that I, with my non-HR brain, could understand. But uh, I'm happy to have the matter looked into. And, to, you know, Elise is also, I'm, I'm pretty sure she wouldn't have an issue to, to come and explain this. Unfortunately, I can't explain the Bain thing. I can't explain HR processes. I'm really clueless on that. But I'm, I, I do take your point that it's worth looking into.
Could I just follow up, uh, Ms. Makola? Yes. In the discussion you had with um, Mr. Dana, mm. did you raise this issue around that you should have actually, in terms of the process that had been followed in mm. other jobs, mm. he too should have simply been confirmed? And did the Asia person respond to that around that, well, uh, your impressions mm. uh, are, are, are incorrect? Look, he did, he did explain that, that because he took some time to take me through the background, even though I had said, look, ultimately I need to know what the end game is of this particular meeting. The HR person was in the room. He still <coughs> insisted because, and in fact, the main reason that he and I were actually having that meeting is because two days before, they had, um, I think was the current person acting in that position of executive and Elise met with him and they said, look, there are two positions that are open. There's senior manager syndicates and another one. I can't remember what, you know, what the senior manager role, the other senior manager role was. And I said, look, you need to pick one. And he said no. And apparently he insisted on coming to see me. And my response when those two ladies said, look, he insists on coming to see you. And I said, look, there's nothing I can do. I mean, if, if there's an HR process that says he can't get the executive, posi the executive position, there's nothing I can do. But in any event, if he wants to meet, let, you know, he can come and meet. And I said, but one condition that I have is that I don't want to be talking about other people because he... Is what I've been told, what I understand is that he felt that he was entitled to the position of executive and that somebody else was entitled to the position of senior manager um, syndicates. And I said, I don't want to talk about other people. I want to talk about him and him alone because I had gotten tired of people coming to my office to complain about their colleagues and, you know, so and so is doing this to me, so and so is doing this to me. And I didn't want to have that particular conversation. So when he came into my office, he did, did take some time to explain the, ba um, the background to me. I can't offhand recall. Was quite some time ago, I can't recall what Elise's response was when he said this, when he explained that he, in his view, he should have gotten the position. Well, I did have to sort of nudge him and say, look, you know, Yusuf, ultimately, I need to know what the end game is here. Are you, what, what, what exactly are you expecting to be the outcome of this particular meeting? So, but I can't remember what Elise said in that meeting. And unfortunately, we didn't make minutes. Yeah, yeah I, th I think the context that one must take into account is we, we've heard a lot of evidence mm. that... The Bain process was used to get rid of employees yeah. that were, were not in favour, um, either to literally drive them out mm. or to put them in these supernumerary positions. Yeah. And Mr. Dinath is saying that's exactly what happened to him. Um, yeah. So uh, I'm suggesting that when you review all of this, you, you do take into account that, that, that that's what we've heard. I, I mean, I've also heard the same thing. Um, people have said this many a times, and in fact, there is a process that we're currently enga um, in engaged in, and uh, currently an organisation to deal with the supernumerary positions. Um, like, you know, unfortunately, I don't know anything about the Bain exercise, but I'm willing to in to interrogate and be educated by my colleagues to, and I don't know whether any of them would be willing to confirm that look, there was a mess up here. I can only commit to looking into it and collectively with my colleagues to find a solution to it. I have no interest in denying Yusuf a position. I only met the guy once, and that was the day that he and I butted heads. I don't know who he is. I didn't know why he'd been suspended. I didn't know what <coughs> he was like. And for the longest time, I couldn't get anyone to tell me why he'd been suspended. So I've got nothing to gain from this. I don't know the, I, I don't I, know the I man. I accept that. Yeah. I, d I do find it curious that you said you find the, 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 the work of the commission a distraction. I, I do. Because if, if I may just finish, yeah. I, I think if, if you had perhaps um, paid attention to what happened here, you might understand better where Mr. Dinath comes from. So I'm, I'm interested to know why you found, why, why you thought what go, that what goes on here is a distraction as a, as a chief officer of this organization. Personally, for me, it keeps me awake at night. Okay. So, and to try and manage my energy levels and to stay committed to the cause, because ultimately, we still have a job to do. So, <coughs> and I wanted to be able to focus on my job. I'm not saying it's not important. I know it's important, and that's why it's here. It's, it's here. But for me, uh, I chose to try and not to get too involved in this. But to the extent that the commission wanted to speak to me, I'm perfectly willing, which is why I'm here, and the judge says, are you willing to give evidence or not? I'm here to give evidence. But it's difficult for me to focus when people are all over are talking about things that happen, especially things that I have no first-hand knowledge of. I can't explain a lot of these things, and I've had many conflicts with people in meetings talking about how they were affected by the introduction of the operating model, an operating model that I have no understanding of. 
But isn't it your no, job sorry. to to try and heal the extraordinary damage that's been inflicted here over the last few years? And, it is. And therefore to understand that damage. No, I, it, it is. And I take it seriously. Um, and I've tried where I could. But I don't think me assisting in the healing process requires me to stay glued to a TV screen watching the proceedings. I'm very sensitive to what people have said, and I've said as much. People that have gotten upset with me when I've said, maybe I've been uh, appeared insensitive, I've apologized, and I've said, look, I don't know what happened, but I understand that it's caused a, lo it caused a lot of damage. So I, I think it's important, and I've seen people who have been broken. In fact, I'm working with one of those people who even lost their marriage. And some people have even contemplated suicide. I'm not insensitive to that. But I don't think to show my sensitivity, I need to be glued to a TV screen. Unfortunately, I have to, as to collect debt. We have 148 billion rand in, uh, in, in debt that needs to be collected. We have outstanding returns of, like, uh, at some point it was over 41 million. At some point, and then it ended up being 66 million. And now it's sitting at 35 million. I'm constantly under pressure. And if I'm going to sit and watch TV, and I can't get things done, but, but it doesn't make me insensitive to what people have gone through. And this is not the first environment where I've seen people being affected in negative ways by restructuring. I'm not insensitive <coughs> to that. I've m even met some of them. So it I is my job to assist in the healing process. Yes, I'm not suggesting you're insensitive. I'm suggesting that if you're going to manage to play a role in the healing of the organization, you do need some insight into what happened. Which is why I've been willing to listen to people. From my first week, I've been getting emails from people with an enforcement who wanted to talk to me about what they've been put through. I don't know if all of it um, has merit, but I've been perfectly willing, notwithstanding the protocol that applies within SARS. I mean, some people have said to me, no, if there is protocol, we can't just walk into your office. And I've said to them, I'm very confused by that because I'm not used to that. I worked at Bowman's where people refer to me by my first name, even 22-year-old, 22-year-olds, Canada attendees refer to me by my name, not Miss McCullough. I come here and I'm being referred to as Miss Makula or ma'am. And I can't, and, and, and people make me m m my coffee and that kind of thing. So I, it's a different environment to me. The, the, pro the protocol is different. It, it was something, a lot, of, a lot to get used to. Not once in my 16 to 17 wo year working life have I ever been referred to as ma'am. Not even by my PA. Raj, I think you had a question. Sorry, I just want, you know, what I'm having difficulty with this is, this is an organiz a major organization of 14,000 people. And the leadership structure who lead this organization are yourself and others. Uh, I'm not, I don't get a sense of the appreciation. You've got your own job to do, you say. But part of your job is to lead the organization. Yes. And um, I hear you say, well, I must talk to sort of look at Ms. Bedina. But why, why has it not been done before? In other words, I, I just question the leadership, yeah. which doesn't recognize that it's a problem that must be overcome, and that's what leadership does. But now you say, well, I'll go and look into it. I can explain. <coughs> I never so got to speak to you. Know, just, sorry. Okay, it, sorry. It just worries me a bit about the future of this organization. Oh. Um, if that is the top leadership's approach to it, which is, uh, you know, I'm sorry, but I'll look into it. Judge, I got advice from my yeah, HR. Sorry. I got advice from my HRBP yes, about no, the, the no recruitment process. SARS has a rule. If you're on suspension, you're not allowed to have contact with SARS employees. Yeah. I couldn't, even if I had been minded to speak to Yusuf, I couldn't do that. He's not allowed to contact. He wasn't allowed to contact me until the day he came back. No, no, I understand that. Yeah. But 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 afterwards, when he did come back, and he insisted on coming to meet with me, and we did meet. But yeah, I know you met, but. Mm -hmm. uh, you seem to have dismissed this problem. No, I didn't. Well, then what is it you're going to look into now? Well, I'm being asked to go and look and whether or not the advice that <coughs> I got was incorrect. Yeah. And I will look into it and have it inter interrogated. But I had no reason to doubt the, correct and the correctness of the advice. And yes, I told Yusuf to get out of my office, but that's because he was being rude to me. No, I, I didn't kick yes. him out because he had a concern. I listened, and when it got uncomfortable, I said to him, look, you know what? Because he threatened to go and embarrass me and also to take me to the CCMA. And when I said to him, look, you can take me to the CCMA if you want. And he suggested that he said, look, of course, you don't, you're not worried about being taken into the CCMA because it's not your money. And I took exception to that. I said, look, I take exception to being, to being portrayed as somebody <coughs> who misuses public funds. So that's why I ended up asking him to leave my office. It's not because I was insensitive to what he's been through. Yeah, I understand. But it's just, you know, the exco here is, I think, a, 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 is the top 
management of a 14,000 mm. person organization. Mm. And these things sound to me as if they're not being dealt with as you would expect of the top organization, top, the top leadership. And the leadership is, you've got your role in enforcement. <coughs> but doesn't it go broader than just looking after my role and if HR tells me X, then I just do what, X, what HR does? Is that, is that how you see the, the function of the top leadership here? Like I said, I had no reason to doubt the advice. And where, and if you ask my colleagues in, le in the legal <coughs> division, where I've had issues with the advice that I was being given, I questioned it. And it has led to tense, the difficult relationship between me and some of my colleagues because I don't just take the advice as it's given to me. If I had a reason to doubt it, I would have said something. But I didn't have a reason to doubt <coughs> it. Sorry. Anyway. Can I ask one question? Sorry. One surprise I've had, following on what the judge and council have said, one of our terms of reference is against the background of everything that's happened mm. is to make recommendations on remedial action. Yes. Right. Now, the top structure of the organisation, its input on that could be quite significant. And that's been my surprise that we haven't had <coughs> ex top coming and saying, this is where we are. These are the problems. Yes. We'd like to give you our inputs yeah. to help you to make recommendations on remedial action. And I know it's the same issue that the judge um, had when I met with him um, at the second meeting that the SARS Exco hadn't been to see him. Um, I can't defend that. Um, I know that subsequent to that we did talk about, in fact after we met the judge for the first time that we need to make a submission. We got recommendations from a team of SARS who said look you need to be making sub submissions to the commission so that they understand what your position is in respect of certain of the issues that have, have arisen. Um, we've, some of us have been following up, one of my colleagues has been following up with the acting commissioner to find out where we are in the process of preventing the, the submission. I cannot defend it. Um, it doesn't look good um, and, and there's no way that I can say, I, I, ca I can make it look good. Um, the point is we should, by now we should have done something. In fact, you know, the judge took his time to come and see us. That's all I can say. Well, I have been told, tell me that you're on ESCO, I have been told and correct me if I'm wrong, that ESCO is waiting to make a, they call it a joint submission. But what they're waiting for is to hear all the evidence first. They're going through the transcript carefully, and when they've gone through the transcript, they're going to make a submission. Is that correct? That was the initial thought. Well, oh, sorry, but is it still the thought? It shouldn't have been, and I, after sorry, I sent the email... can I just get clarity? Is that the position at the moment? It looks that way, but it <coughs> shouldn't be judged, because no, after... Sorry, I, I want to know, because I'm, I'm sitting there. No one from Exco has come and told me about this joint submission. I understand. Is it, but you're from Exco. Is it correct that that's what Exco intends doing? Judge, we do want to make a joint submission. And in fact, after I met with you, we spoke about expediting this process. One of my colleagues, Mamate Makhekebakuan, has been following up with the acting commissioner about this as to why we have not made a joint submission. As recently as yesterday, somebody from an employee of SARS who's been sitting and watching the proceedings said, why hasn't ESCO done anything to make a submission? So my understanding and my view was that that position had changed. There was an urgency about it, but something hasn't moved. And we, the people have been following up with the acting commissioner. I don't know why that has still not been done. But, uh, but you're a member of ESCO. Yes, but we haven't got an answer from the acting commissioner. We've been following up because we need to do this. No, but are you, I mean, you're not, uh, that's the acting commissioner, but, yes. but there is, the acting commissioner is not the whole of Exco. No, he's not. This, this, you must let me finish, otherwise you won't hear what I, my concern is. You see, my concern is the reactive approach of, of uh, Exco, apparently, you say it was, I don't know if it's still is, the reactive approach, which is, let me hear all the evidence and then I'll make a submission. It's, it, it just doesn't strike me as the leadership position. The leadership in an organization takes the proactive role. But here we're seeing it's almost a little like junior employees who are waiting to hear it and then come and defend it, as it were. It's, it just seems to me a bit odd. I don't know if my colleagues who are in business, uh, these Very are the businessmen. I I'm accept just a judge. Oh, what do I know about running an organization? Look, I accept that that's how it looks to you, but I'm also trying to give you another angle to it, that there is a discussion that's happening. I can't explain the thinking, because we've been following up. Mamate has been pushing 
and pushing but, and raising but, uh, haven't and escalating. you talked about this in Exco? We have. And have you said to yourselves, look, we are the leadership here. We must take the lead in the organization. We've been hearing evidence. I think, I don't know, 60 witnesses we've heard. We heard evidence of, of people being uh, frightened in this place, intimidated and mm. felt, whatever. Where's the leadership coming and explaining it? They're sitting, you say, they still haven't decided what to do. Yeah, is that, but is that correct? You haven't decided what to do? Short of forwarding you the, the email correspondence that's been flying around amongst the EXCO members, I don't know if there's anything else I can say w to you. Well, I must say, I'd like to see this email correspondence because I haven't heard a word from EXCO. You're the first person, and thank you for coming to see me. Although I did say to you at the time, it worries me a little that you came to see me because someone had mentioned you. Yes. And I'd said to you, but it's fair enough, but, but why do I only get a reaction from someone in EXCO? Because they are mentioned. Why not talk about the organization? That's what my concern is. Eh? That's I what I conveyed to you, I yeah, think. Yeah, and I understood where you were coming from. <coughs> and I think and it's a fair point, isn't it? Very fair, and which is why when I finished my meeting with you, I went straight to my office and sent an email to all my colleagues. And there was a l debate that happened afterwards about whether or not we should be coming here. To get because what I do recall you said, you want ex members to come and speak to you publicly because he's a public human. No, no, that's not correct. I didn't say I wanted. I said that's what I would expect to have happened in a big organization. Okay. Sorry about Convey that. Convey that to your colleagues, that that's what I would have thought would happen. That the first people who would come forward in this, with these terms of reference would be the management. And yet one has had to start <coughs> with the people at the bottom, as it were, because we haven't heard from management. People, a lot of the people at the bottom have come to say what's going on here. Mm, I know, but I, I haven't heard a word from Exco. Oh, you can ask me now. And well, I will ask you now. What do you have you heard? Do you know that uh, that people are afraid in this place? I know. I was one of those people. Sorry. I was one. I'm one of those people. You're who also afraid. afraid. Yes. Afraid of what? Because I was told that I needed to keep my head down and stop being so outspoken when I had disagreements with some of my exco colleagues. Uh, by who? I asked some of my direct reports because they saw me having heated debates with. One of the people I did, like I said, I, that I said I did have a good relationship with. Who? I had a very strained relationship with Jonas Makwakwa, yeah. and I was very outspoken about how unhappy I was, yeah. what I perceived to be interference in a, a division that I'd been employed to to, to run. So you, you've also been afraid. Yes. Well, how does one run an organisation when the top management is afraid? Well, I don't know, but I'm human, Judge. I'm sorry, you know, to ask these questions, but they are very burning them. questions yeah. for the future of this organisation. Look, Judge, now, if the top management is afraid, well, then I can understand why the people down below are afraid. And I say, well, how? What's going to happen to this organisation? It must it go forward with everybody being afraid, including the top management? Look, I can't say I mean, all if the, the top board of directors of a company were to say, "I'm afraid of the anyone," I'd say, "Well, please go and get another board of directors." You, I mean, you can understand my problem. No, I can understand your problem. So but what do you want to respond to that? I mean, should you be in the position if you're afraid? Uh, that's up to you, Judge. That's but not up to me. No, but I mean, I'm I can't... Not, yeah, it's not up to me. Look, I'm asking I, your view. Look, I uh, accepted the offer of employment in this position because I felt that I was qualified for it. So if the view is that because I have a tendency to be afraid when I'm warned to watch my mouth and having disagreements with some of my ex colleagues is that that disqualifies me for the job. There's nothing I can do about that. Yeah. Did you start watching your mouth, or did you continue to raise the issues of concerns that you found uh, merited uh, being raised? Look, I, I, w I'm having been, I've always said like I'm uncultured. I don't always edit myself. So I would get upset, and I would speak up about uh, what made me unhappy. Um, I've ha I had several meetings with where the commissioner told me and called me in to address my difficult relationship with certain of my colleagues um, because I was extremely vocal. And even at the EXO meetings, I've been extremely vocal where I felt that people were trading in territory that they shouldn't unless they had an understanding of how the business worked, like that particular business unit worked. I haven't been able to watch my mouth. But with yourself having raised the issues with, okay. the, with, the, with the acting commissioner, yeah. Rather, with the with the commissioner, yeah. were there any ways of working devised to make mm. sure that you don't have this problem, the pr kind of problem that gave rise to the fear? None to my satisfaction. The outcome of each of those interactions was always that we must work as a team. We must work as a team. We must be collegial to each other. 
But what I felt was that you can't expect people to be collegial to each other if certain of those people are feeling disrespected. And I made it very clear that I was feeling undermined and disrespected by some of my colleagues. And in, in the, I mean, it was one of them, he, like at some point, want, want, he wanted to tell me that I shouldn't have appointed a certain person in a position because they felt that that, position, that person wasn't qualified for the position. He went, even went so far as to say, look, I made that person who he is. Um, I mean, I, 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 I've been here for a long period of time, and I understand these people. And I took exception to that. And in your opinion, that person was properly qualified for the role? I felt he was qualified. You know, I've, I've heard about you and, and how it affected you. I'm, I, perhaps I'm talking about someone else. I'm talking about the people that you manage. Yes. All the, but I mean, what, have you done anything about that? That's been going on since you arrived, apparently. Uh, I, I really am concerned. Yeah, look, you I... Know, sorry. The, the, I'm you know, there's some, there some. I'm really terrible. I'm there, sorry. I no, apologize. no, no. I don't want you to feel terrible. I, I really I apologize. Not. I don't want you to feel terrible. We've got a job <coughs> to do, and we've got to report on this organisation, which is a vital organisation, a massive one to run, and a vital organisation. And you know, we've had people who don't even want to be seen in our office for fear of, of repercussions. Mm. You know that one woman, I think it was, she took sick. She, she pretended she was going to the doctor. Mm. Came around the back door. Yeah. Now, are you, are you aware of that atmosphere in this place? The atmosphere of What about your own particular position? What have you done for them? For That's the people that I work with directly? Sorry? So for the people that I work with directly? That's for the 14,000 people who work here. But I can't assure every single person, because I don't have contact with every single person. I haven't, but I'm, I have an open door policy. Anybody can come and see me. And even people who are not in my division come and share their concerns with me. And in those instances where I felt that it needed to be dealt with by s somebody in addition to me. I've gone to the HR um, head and said, look, this person, uh, for instance, there was a young lady who came to tell me, she's a graduate, who told me that she was being ill-treated by her supervisor. I took that matter up. I agreed that I'll look into it, and I went and spoke to the, the head of HR. So I do try. Now that's somebody who comes to your door, and I can expect that would be quite proper from a group executive or an executive, someone in their thing. I'm talking about the chief officers who make up the exco which runs the whole place, 14,000. You're not su are you suggesting that they must sit back and wait for someone to knock on their door? You don't understand my problem. I understand, Judge. I actually have tried to travel to other offices. You have to understand, I haven't been here long enough to go to each and every office, but I have tried. I can't say that what I've done is a stellar job, but I really have tried. To the extent that I've even invited some of the senior managers that I hardly have, a co have, uh, have contact with to come to workshops. And we had even a had a strategy discussion last year where some of the senior managers that I don't work with directly, but they don't report to me directly. And I, one of the things I said to them, I said, if you do everything by the book, I will go to war with you. That is a speech that I made. And I said, I'll go to war with you. I said, as long as it's based on the act, because we're a creature of statute. Anything beyond that, I can't back you. And I've always been clear with my colleagues in, in, in my enforcement division that to the extent that you feel that you're being for, I'm asking you to do something that is unethical, you are most welcome to defy me and even report me because it's not what I'm here for. And I'm also not prepared to be made to do things that I feel compromise my integrity. I said that to my team. Ms. Mangula, Ms. Have, have you dealt with this? I mean, I'm looking now at the exco as a collective. Yeah. You've been aware of this sense of culture of fear, intrigue, mm -hmm. etc. Yeah. Have you discussed this, discussed it as ESCO, and determine what measures have to be taken by the ESCO mm -hmm. to deal with this, rather than just good individuals on an individual basis, and those who are probably mean don't have to to, to mind about them. Just yeah. looking now, you're the leaders yeah. of the organisation, yeah. and you are aware as an organisation that as the leaders. There, there, there is this problem. Yes. Has there something been discussed around what must be done mm. to deal with that? It has been discussed and some things have been done. I don't know if they've had the desired impact, but we have tried. The commission, the acting commissioner, we agreed that he, you know, he, he sends out these newsletters and like good few <coughs> stories and talks to the staff. Because it was clear that there was a lack of communication. We needed to reassure people. And whatever statements he issued, we all had uh, had sight of them, and we approved that the message should go out. I don't know whether it has comforted people, but what I have seen that is that since the 19th of March, people have been more open. They have felt more comfortable 
being open about what they've been through. Um, a lot of them direct their, 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 their concerns to Mark, and he makes sure, and he, whatever, whichever division the person uh, reports in, uh, the chief officer would be tasked with, the, uh, with addressing that issue. So there is a change. People are sort of less afraid of coming forward and talking about their experiences. Now, sorry, you're talking about now the period since uh, of the acting commissioner. What about the period you were here when the commissioner was here? What did you do then? I d look, I don't, I don't recall us discussing those, and I also don't recall there being much uh, by way of openness from employees to elevate their concerns to him. Um, again, I can only speak to the people that have come to me directly. Maybe I shouldn't have waited for them to come back to me, to come to me directly. I should have traveled more, uh, but I, was, I thought I was doing the right thing by trying to learn the business. But those people who came to talk to me about their concerns, I did try and do my best. No, but I'd like to just hear what you say in response, response to Mr. Kushler's yeah. question. During the period that the commissioner was here, yeah. did Exco discuss what was happening here and, and the fear that was being here, you know, that was prevalent and yeah. so forth? Did you have no discussions at that time? I don't think we did because I don't recall us ever having that particular discussion. Why not? I don't know why. Well, well, I mean, you were one of Exco. Why, why wasn't it initiated? I don't know, Judge. I can't explain that. That's fine. I was going to put the question slightly differently. At that stage, was Exco a functional body? Was it dysfunctional? Now, our concern is this is one of the most fundamental institutions in the country. Yeah. And we're talking about the top leadership of that. Was it a dysfunctional, functional? From where I was standing, I, I think we could have done better. Like I said, I... I mean, I, there were two people that are in Exco that I couldn't bear to have a conversation with, and that speaks to a dysfunctional Exco. Um, I, the reason I w had conflicts with them is because I felt that they were interfering and undermining. Um, so I decided at some point that, look, whatever I, even if I elevated the issues to the commission, he wasn't going to address them uh, to my satisfaction. So I decided that, um, you know, I'll keep my interaction with them um, at a minimum. I don't think it was the wisest decision to make, but at that time, I thought it was the right one to do. It was a it was a better option than having butting heads with people constantly. What was the second one you mentioned, Mr. Makwaka? What was the second one you had difficulty with? Um, um, there's I should have said three because it was Mark Jonas, and I also didn't have a good relationship with um, Rafilo Mokwena. Um, and the commissioner and I were not very close. Um, I did get a sense that that just wasn't his type of person. Did you ever confront the commissioner on the problems that you saw here? And say, Commissioner, we're the exco and this must be done. Did you ever confront him? Which particular problems? The dysfunction well, <coughs> in exco or the fact that no, people were No, no, the were problems afraid? in the organization, you, you know, for example, that everyone was afraid, including yourself. <coughs> did you confront the commissioner and say, we must correct this? No, I did not. Ms. Makola, was, uh, was, were, were the members of EXCO aware of the fear and the other concerns which have been raised by, by employees? Did you talk, did, I mean, just between yourselves, without being in the in a formal EXCO meeting, mm. were you, did you get a sense that everyone was aware of it? And maybe there was no platform, to, uh, there was no platform in which to discuss it uh, in the presence of mm. the commissioner? Look, I, I, I can't speak for other people because I don't. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I can't speak for other people. Um, one thing I can tell you is that I started being very careful with certain people because I didn't know who to trust. I was the last of the exco members to arrive, and I had concerns about certain things that I saw happening. When I confided in people and said, "Look, I don't understand why this kind of thing is happening," I didn't get any joy. But as to the fear amongst the employees. I know of it, not because I felt it as well, but because people did come to speak to me about it. Um, but I don't, I couldn't, I didn't feel safe elevating this to the commissioner at the time. And I don't remember even talking to uh, my extra colleagues about it, because usually with these people, when they came to confide in me about these things, they were fearful already, and they would not have been comfortable with me. In fact, a lot of them would say, look, you know, just <laughs> if you could keep it to yourself. People are generally, af were generally afraid. So how do I do that? Let go and divulge, and then what happens with that person afterwards? I don't know whether they get victimized or not. And I mean, even as recently as now, um, a gentleman in one of my divisions came to me to tell me that he thinks that a recruitment process that didn't go his way was um, 
you know, wasn't conducted properly. And you know, it actually, it's not that one. It's that somebody else who complains. As really, but he also had issues uh, with his senior management. And when I said to him, look, I'm going to talk to your senior manager and find out exactly what happened. And what his response was that, look, yeah, you can talk to, to, to them, but you, know, you must just appreciate that there's a fear of victimization. When you say uh, you didn't feel safe raising it with the commissioner, why not? Because I'd seen how he reacted when I had questioned certain things. Yeah. Are you aware that as we sit here today, mm. there are many, many people who are still scared of the current executive, of certain members on the current executive? Mm. Are you aware of that? I wouldn't dismiss it. I wouldn't dismiss it. I'm, I, I would accept that there are some people. Could you just sit back a little Sorry. bit? Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't, I wouldn't dismiss it. Um, I don't know if those people would come and confide in me and tell me that they're afraid of me or the other members of EXCO, but I, w I wouldn't dismiss that possibility. Because I've been told ag again and again, mm. uh, some people who won't even come and testify, yeah. not because they're scared of Mr. Moyani, mm. but because they're scared of a couple of people mm. who are, were on his executive and yeah. still on his executive. Yeah. So I wonder how the executive is addressing that. That's not historical, that's real time. Yeah. Uh, look, I, 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 I don't know which members they say they're afraid of, but obviously that's a perception that we need to, to take on board and deal with it. Um, I can speak, f I don't know if anybody's afraid of me, but like I said, I, not everybody's cup of tea. So to the extent that anybody is afraid of me, I'll take it as a, as, as a criticism uh, that I need to address my manner in the manner in which I interact with people. No, I'm not suggesting they're afraid of you. No, it's fine. Even <laughs> if they're saying it, um, they're entitled to feel the way that they do. And it's up to me to take that on board and address it. And I think every other member of EXCO, to the extent that they are aware that they're, being f they're feared by our, co our more junior colleagues, then we need to take that on board as a valid criticism because you know, just because we don't see ourselves as scary individuals, but if somebody is saying that I'm afraid, that feeling is valid and it needs to be addressed and we have to find a way to interact with our colleagues in a less frightening manner. Well, I think it's a little bit more complex than that, in that as, as we've understood the evidence this far, yeah. the atmosphere of fear was created deliberately. It wasn't a, a, a byproduct. Uh. It, was, it was created deliberately um, you know, the first step that the commissioner took was to suspend his ex -co, I've heard uh, of that. And, and start investigating people, um, putting up cameras, which mm. frightened people. Sure. Now, there are still members of the executive who are associated with that strategy. So it's not a question of sensitizing them mm. to the fact that people are scared. It, it, it runs a little deeper than that. Yeah. It's understanding they appeared to be part of a strategy yeah. to create a reign of terror, which they did successfully. Mm. Well, we'll, and we'll still decide, here. yeah, but are we going to weigh all that up as to what it was? But I think that you, what you want to know from her is that there is that fear, uh, and, and one wants to know what Exco is aware of, and do they do it? But how that was created, I think, is a matter we must just leave for us to decide. Mm. But I want to ask another one, and that is, We've heard a lot of evidence from people in supernumerary positions, mm. very skilled people. Yes. And they're sitting in supernumerary positions. Are you aware of that? I'm aware of that, and we're also, that's one of the things that we're addressing at the moment. But, but I mean, you've been here for a year, yes. the Exco. Yes. And they've been sitting there. Why has nothing been done about that from it the Exco side? It is being done now. Oh, I understand it's being yeah. done now. There's an acting commissioner. Uh, what I want to know is why nothing was done by Exco about that while Mr. the commissioner was here. I mean, the, the when did you start? Third of July, twenty seventeen. July seventeen, and the commissioner was suspended. Nineteenth of March, twenty eighteen. It's quite a long time to be sitting there with knowing that all these supernumeraries are there, skilled people, and nothing happening. Look, to be honest with you, I didn't understand that there was anything wrong with those positions. I found the structure w as what it was, I had no inkling that there was an issue with those positions. Okay. Um, you know, n now that we're on it, uh, you, you mentioned that um, you <coughs> felt that your portfolio, that, that certain members of the executive had interfered with your uh, portfolio. Yeah. You mentioned the one incident where Mr. McQuackwa uh, had 
uh, to try to control who you appoint. Yeah. But you mentioned another couple of uh, incidents to me which I, I do think are relevant. Yes. Uh, and I, I think uh, you should tell the Commission about those incidents. Okay. Um, the, the one being, uh, it concerns a taxpayer, and I'd rather you didn't name Thanks the company, if you don't mind, yeah. it concerned their, their debt of 54 million rand. Perhaps you can just uh, t tell us what happened there. Okay. Uh, before I, I tell you about that, uh, it wasn't inter influencing who I had to hire. I'd already hired the individual. He was just expressing that maybe I'd hired the wrong, wrong person. With you. So with this particular taxpayer, they owed us a debt. Um, and you must understand, I don't really get involved in the operational stuff. That's not a forte that I need to be getting involved. But it was elevated because the taxpayer was complaining that um, a committee had re refused to grant them a suspension um, of payment of the debt. So this issue was elevated. And I looked into it with the debt management team and, and then obviously the relationship person uh, who said, look, we, you know, we're sort of taking, we're being heavy handed with the taxpayer. So we started engaging with the taxpayer. Um, because and what I was, and I also to speak to the audit team to understand what the issue was. What I was told by the audit team was that, look, the suspension request was denied because the taxpayer was in a position to pay the debt. In fact, they made that very clear that they could pay the debt, but they were refusing to pay it because they had an issue with the merits of the assessment. And my response to that was that, but I have yet to come across. Sorry. And my response to that was that I have yet to come across a taxpayer who readily accepts an assessment that's been issued against them. They taxpayers are especially when the assessment is for a huge amount, they tend to fight. Um, so that, that was always the argument that I made. And then also I said, look, it looks like they don't meet the requirements of Section 164 of the Tax Administration Act, which governs requests for suspension. So they threatened to take us on review, the decision of the committee on review, and that's fine. Um, obviously that made us very uncomfortable. Um, and they were, they were requested to provide more information for the committee to consider whether or not to reverse its earlier decision. They provided that information, um, and the committee still came to the same conclusion that they couldn't grant the suspension. And on the 22nd, around there, early this year, I went, um, I was in Durban for the Senate returns campaign, but I also met with the taxpayer and their tax advisor, and I was with two of my colleagues from the debt management division. And we discussed with the taxpayer, the taxpayer had certain concerns, uh, and then one of them was whether or not they would get paid interest if they paid the debt and in full, pending the outcome of the dispute. But there was an objection that they'd lodged. We said we'd look into it. So we a few things that we needed to get back to them on. And the next thing, a few weeks later, I stumble into a boardroom, um, and I see the people from the company and with the tax advisor sitting in that boardroom. And I got confused. They looked familiar, but I knew I didn't have a meeting with them. But it turns out that they were having a meeting with um, Jonas, and I think Rafila was also a part of the meeting. And I wanted to, and I was obviously distressed because surely I should have been part of that because we're trying to collect the debt, and we needed to give to have a holistic view. I don't know what happened at that meeting, but I was seriously upset about it to the point that I went to the commissioner and told him that look. I feel like there's no place for me here, the way that things are done. I don't understand why uh, uh, Jonathan Rifle would have a meeting with a taxpayer in my absence on a matter this crucial, especially since, in fact, debt management is tasked with collecting revenue. And if a committee has made a decision, why are we sort of questioning the decision of the committee? And I, I do remember also there were emails flying around between me and Jonas where he sort of indicated sort of implied that the committee that had made the decision to refuse the suspension was biased because it was loaded with, me its members were primarily from the data management division. To which I responded and I said, look, I firstly, I, I think I said it wasn't correct. And then I said to him, look, I am unwilling to overturn a decision that was made by a committee. I can't do that. And I even remember asking for a copy of the terms of reference of that, that particular um, committee and I sent him a copy of it, just to indicate that there are ways in which the committees make their decisions and how those decisions can be reversed, and that no single individual can overturn it. And I said, like, we cannot, the three of us communicate, because it was me and him and some other person in, um, I think, relationship management. I said, we cannot do this. 
um, we cannot we can't overturn the decision of a committee. A co the committee will have to re reconsider uh, the position that it took. But we can't sit here and debate the merits of a decision made by a, a, group, a whole group of people. So that was the one um, little matter. And but, but the upshot was that the suspension was granted, notwithstanding the committee's decision. The, but it wasn't granted by him. There was additional information that was again provided by the taxpayer, which was brought to the committee, and eventually the committee, based on that information in front of them, it decided to grant the suspension. But, you know, leading up to that, there was um, a friction between myself and him, and what I, and also I thought it was, it wasn't right that we should question the decision of a committee um, of people who are supposed to exercise independent judgment on the decision. So, but ultimately the committee, based on additional information was, that was provided, it, and Jonas doesn't sit on that committee, by the way. Okay. So the different chair, per, the person, the per, chairperson is a different person. But they did finally grant the suspension. So that was one of the things I found objectionable in how he and I related. Well, indeed, um, why, I didn't get all of that, perhaps, but the, the, the committee had said, no, we won't suspend it. And then is it Mr. McQuackwa meeting with the taxpayer? Yes, he... Discussing suspending it. I don't know what they discussed, but... Well, the he came back to you and said that uh, the committee is biased and you should suspend it. Is that right? Yeah, it was on email. But that was prior to that particular meeting that <coughs> why, he was having. Why was he table. meeting with the taxpayer? I have no idea, Judge. Is that usual? I've met with taxpayers, so it's not unusual for chief officers. Um, what I found unusual was that the chief officer of enforcement was not part of the meeting. It was Jonas and um, and Rafilo who were there, and the chief officer of enforcement, or at least somebody Jonas from... Jonas and... And Rafilwe, the chief of legal. Rafilwe Mokwena. Yeah. What I found odd was that nobody from enforcement was there, at least. Yes. And that was what made me get very upset and speak to, to the commissioner. And I, and I was in tears when I spoke to him. And I said, look, I feel like I don't have a role here. I don't have a place here because I'm well, feeling... Doesn't it go, you, you say you went and you were in tears because you didn't have a role. Doesn't it go a bit further than that? I mean, why are they talking to the taxpayer after the, de after the committee has said no? Doesn't, I, I, so doesn't it go a bit beyond just your own personal position. Isn't it a, a worrying thing? Look, it was worrying, particularly because n n none of the people who were directly involved in the discussion of the taxpayer, I mean, it take me out of it because yeah. I, I only had one meeting with the taxpayer because it was escalated to me. But the debt management guy, and I remember I was with one of them when we stumbled into the, uh, into the boardroom, even he did not know about it. And in fact, to... In addition to me being in tears in, um, in the commissioner's office, I did call one of my colleagues, I think it was the acting commissioner now, and I said to him, I think I'm going to resign. I can't work like this. What was the reaction of the commissioner to that? He said to me, look, he feels that I belong at SARS, I'm qualified for the job, and that he didn't have any ulterior motives for hiring me other than based on my qualifications, and that in his view, I did have a place um, at SARS. Uh, but, you know, if I felt I didn't have a place, he couldn't stand in my way. So I think that was his way of trying to reassure me. But did he start, did he do anything else to sort of change, deal with the working environment, deal with ways of working and show that people understand mm. what can or can't be done? Look, he, I know, I know his, his um, emails that he's, he would send and he also there was a meeting that I was called into. It was me and Jonas and Rafilo were in that meeting. And where he said, look, obviously he understands that there's an issue here, but we need to be collegial, we must work as a team, and we must learn to talk to each other. Instead of sending emails, we must talk to each other in person. Um, so that was his way of trying to deal with it. But from where I was standing, it was ineffective. Um, and I took a decision that my engagement with those two colleagues would be very minimal. Well, that, but I too, sorry. Uh, uh, maybe I don't understand the processes here. But what seems to me to be more worrying than that you were being excluded is a debt com the, the, the committee had said no, mm. and then Mr. McQuackwa and Ms. Uh, McQuenna are meeting with the taxpayer to discuss now going back and saying, go and persuade the, the, the committee to overturn this. I mean, I can understand the taxpayer being mm. unhappy and saying I want to submit further information to the debt committee. But was there no discussion between you and the commissioner as to what on earth Mr. McQuackwa and Ms. McQuenna were doing discussing the affairs of the 
taxpayer after the committee had said, no, you can't have a suspension. Was there no such discussion between you and the commissioner? There was that one discussion. What did he say about the taxpayer issue? Forget about whether you should feel that you're in the organization or not. Did he not say anything about the taxpayer? You look as if you're trying to remember. I would have thought no. it would be very clear in your head. If, if it was a while back, Judge. Huh? I mean, it was a while back. And well, I want to be, it was a while back, and I don't want to say no, no, something no, that is fine, untrue. But it's, it, it's, it seems I, to me it's a very important thing in a tax organization. No. I can't remember. That, uh, that, am, am I wrong? I mean, I can't remember whether he did raise a concern. I, what I, I think he did say he would discuss, have a discussion with Jonas or something to that effect. Um, but I, Refilo's involvement, I think, the way that it was subsequently explained to me by a junior member of the staff was that um, because the taxpayer had threatened to take us to court to take the decision of the committee on review. So it was decided that legal would meet with the taxpayer. I don't know what they discussed at that meeting. And to this day, I don't know what, they, what the outcome of that. You were told that by a junior member, you said? Yes, I was. Well, what did you ask about the senior manager, the people, as to what was going on? I mean, you can't rely on the junior, surely, to tell you what's going on at the top. Look, like I said, Judge, the best way I knew how to deal with this was to go in and firstly speak to the commissioner and tell him that I found this undesirable. Can I just ask process of this? Mm. When the committee decided not to grant the suspension, mm. that would have been communicated to the taxpayer in accordance with ordinary channels? Yes, there is. Not by Mr. McQuacqua and Ms. McQuena? No, there's usually a letter that I think goes, that goes from the chair of the committee. In fact, I think I need to just also give context. It was because there are different levels of these committees. There was a first committee that decided this, and and the decision was not to grant the suspension. And then I think it was elevated to the second level, well, the higher level of the committee. And that committee, I think, also came to the same decision. And I think that was also part of the argument that I had with Jonas was that it's not just a lower level committee. Another committee, a higher committee, had so made the same decision. So two levels that happened, yeah. and that's communicated to the taxpayer in accordance with ordinary channels. Yeah. Then uh, the taxpayer goes to Mr. McQuacqua. Uh, no, I don't think, th they didn't go to, my, uh, to, to, to Jonas Marquardt, but they went through the relationship person. Because remember, it's a large business <coughs> client. Well, not, re not remember, I didn't mention that they were a large business client, but they, they because of the, the large business, the um, taxpayers, they usually have um, a sort of a relationship interface person. So they were speaking to that particular person. In fact, I remember that there was another meeting of the committee where that relationship person made submissions again. I don't know whether it was a second level or another level. Would, you know, motivating for the suspension to be granted because of the reputation of the, the particular taxpayer at the time. Um, and even then, after that person had made those submissions, the committee still took a decision to not grant the suspension based on the information that was before them. But subsequently, with additional information, the, other, like the last committee finally decided to, to, to grant the suspension, but there was additional information that I know did come through. But that extra information, did that flow after a discussion between that taxpayer on the one hand and Mr. McQuacqua and Ms. McQueen on the other hand? I think it did because I was in the meeting, I sat in on, a, on, a, on a, in the meeting where the suspension was finally granted. Ms. McQuena, if uh, had it not been for, so, so, so the committee made a final decision mm -hmm. not to grant the suspension. The earlier one, yes. The earlier one, mm -hmm. and then the meeting happened. Uh, was that uh, the, the, the decision not to grant the suspension, was that made before the, the, the last uh, or the higher level committee was, was, was going to decide on the matter? Or was it after that uh, the last committee had, I mean, it, was that the last committee which made the decision? I'm, I'm better okay. to understand the question. I, I don't know how many tiers of committees do you have, but you told us about the first committee and the second committee. Which uh, committee makes the final decision? The second committee? I think it was the third committee. Because I think we got tier one, tier two, and tier three. Okay. I think it was tier three that, that had to consider the request for suspension again. And that committee did grant the suspension. Okay. But the, the earlier ones had refused to grant it. And I think even tier three, there was a point where it was, they sent a letter to the taxpayer to ask for additional information. I think the taxpayer was also unwilling to provide the additional information. So it was a very difficult um, interaction even with the taxpayer. But subsequently, the taxpayer did sort of relent and provide the information that which the committee requested to consider and they came to Sorry, the did Ms. Kitt, that 
The taxpayer didn't want to submit the information. That was what I was told by the audit team. I can understand the taxpayer being very anxious to submit more information. But who it, some, you had to extract the information from the taxpayer in order to grant what the taxpayer wanted. I wouldn't say extract, because they, they were arguing with the request. I think they, their view was that they'd already provided this information. Why was the committee down. asking? Yeah, and why was the committee asking for more information? I, so I think that was their view. I, I, I wouldn't... I think, it, it, look, it, Judge, by the time the relationship had soured. Yeah. Um, so, and, and also they were quite suspicious of the audit team. They felt that the audit team was biased. Yeah. So there was an, a level of distrust from the very beginning. Yeah. But now what confuses me is if uh, the, the tier two committee had said no, why would SAS issue a communication to the taxpayer saying it's been declined? Would, would, would it not have been uh, the decision of the third committee to say no before SAS declines? Mm -mm. No, so the different levels of committees are monetary thresholds that govern which matters go to which committee. So the first level of committee, I think that's where it went, and then the request was was uh, was not granted. <coughs> the taxpayer had an issue with that. So the best way, so I mean, if I refuse to give you what you want, there's no point in you coming back to me to reconsider my decision if I'm convinced I'm right. Mm -hmm. So I think the decision was that go to the high level. You know, this must be referred to the high level committee. Maybe they'll come to a different decision. That's the checks and balances. And that committee didn't come to a different decision. And so, and then I think by the time I was brought into this matter was when the taxpayer, I think, had, was complaining, um, and the relationship managers were, like, were, were raising issues about how this taxpayer was being treated, that we're being unfair, we're being too heavy-handed with this particular taxpayer. Um, so it, it was a, yeah, like it was a, there was just friction, um, even between the audit team and the relationship management team. Uh, it, I think that by then, even uh, by, the, by the time that I, sort of got uh, pulled into into the discussions. It looked like the relationship had soured from the very beginning because I think even during the audit process, um, the taxpayer felt that the audit team uh, was biased towards them. And I remember even our legal colleagues had to have, have another look at it. There was a colleague, um, I think a senior manager or an executive, I can't remember, to, uh, to give an opinion, to go through the file and give an opinion as to whether or not the assessment that had been raised were defendable. So was the taxpayer persuaded to provide the information uh, by that meeting? I don't know. I remember I wasn't at the meeting. I don't know why they ended up cooperating with the committee that that, that made the, the the final decision to grant this. I don't. I, I, I don't know. Where, I can't. I don't want to speculate that that particular meeting had anything to do with it. But the point is, I know that the chair of the committee did um, send a letter to the taxpayer because it was important that the relationship. Um, be mended, the, and, and, the, and there was a lot of distrust be, um, between the, the SARS audit team and the taxpayers, so somebody more neutral um, had to sort of, it was, the, the, the view was that it maybe it's better if somebody more neutral wasn't directly, in, getting in, wasn't directly involved in the matter to, to have the discussions with the, with the taxpayer. And I mean, the, the chair of the committee is the um, chief officer of finance, um, and, I recall, and we, I recall that there were discussions that were held uh, between him and some of our legal colleagues, I don't know whether he actually, he, he even whether he didn't meet with the taxpayer. But the point is, a lot happened between the meeting between Jonas and and, and Refilo and the taxpayer, and the final decision that was, that was made. There were other interactions between um, the chair of the committee and the taxpayer, and I think it was to encourage them to at least cooperate with the process, provide the information that the uh, the committee felt was needed to look at the decision and with a fresh, fresh pair of eyes. Am I right in understanding you that there was not, you're not making issue about the, those two chief officers having made, met with the taxpayer, but with them having met with the taxpayer in the absence of the enforcement chief officer? Yes, I, I, I mean I felt that that was not the right way to approach it, um, and there was no, and if we're going to be presenting, and I think I also said this that look, we're giving the wrong impression to a taxpayer that the different parts of the, the organization don't talk to each other. I mean, how, and then what, does, what impression does it create to a taxpayer when the person that they met with earlier in the year is suddenly not in the meeting, not invited in the meeting? I mean, to this day, I don't really fully understand why at least somebody from debt management, it didn't have to be me, it could have been uh, Clement, it could have been Chris Madima, it could have been Mergen Naidu, but none of those people were invited. And we, in fact, not just in the fact that we were not invited, we didn't even know that the meeting was happened. The only reason I knew about that meeting was because I walked into a boardroom in which I thought I was supposed to meet to meet with, or have a meeting with another person, and that's when I realized that I, I recognized the people in that room. 
or you can ask this one, the additional information that tilted the scale. Mm. Did you know what it was? Was that material? Should it have had that impact? Like, I'll, I'll have to get that information, but I know we debated this issue at length and uh, to the point of where I was accused by, not accused, but as somebody jokingly said, look at geez, you know, you're, you're very angry about this because I had a particular view, um, which I think was influenced by prior um, discussions about why it is that the client was, the taxpayer was asking for a, a suspension. So yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. But Sorry, did Mr. McQuakwa and make representations to the final committee? No, he wasn't in the room. It was a member of the legal division. Am I correct in assuming that whatever the fights you had had before, mm. the decision that was ultimately taken, you were comfortable that it was justified on the merits? Yes, I was. I, but it, it, remember, it was preceded by a quite uh, an intense debate. In, in by all of us that, that were in the meeting. And I think even Rafila was there. I can't remember who <coughs> else was in the meeting, but there was an intense debate, and I think that's how it should be, um, that these, you know, must ventilate these things and interrogate the legislation that we're applying. And um, that's the only way we can be comfortable that at least a, a well-thought-out decision um, is reached. But it seems to me the problem is not so much one of personal relationships, however bad they are. The problem is a governance problem. You know, we, we heard um, evidence early on from Sunita Manik, who, who ran the LBC mm. uh, before the changes happened. And we heard about very strict controls mm. over who could and couldn't meet with a taxpayer, mm. particularly around questions of settlements, of debt, uh, etc. cetera. Mm. Uh, she told us that in those days, um, there was absolutely no question of a commissioner <coughs> or a CO meeting with a taxpayer. There were designated committees and designated people, mm. and it could not be countenanced <coughs> that other senior people could then step in when a taxpayer was unhappy. Mm. But it sounds like there aren't those kind of governance procedures anymore. Am I right? Look, I don't... The commissioner always took the view that he shouldn't meet with taxpayers. But I, I mean, I, as a chief officer of enforcement, I've met with several taxpayers when something gets um, escalated to me because taxpayers would write to the commissioner and complain that they're being ill-treated by someone. It could be debt management or an auditor is misbehaving or is being untoward towards a taxpayer. And that would be ask, um, sort of that, that email would be forwarded to me. There's a proce process that I found there. So these emails would be forwarded to me to, to, to deal with. Then a decision would be taken whether or not um, I should be in the meeting to meet with this particular taxpayer to hear. Because sometimes these taxpayers would insist that they want to meet with a senior person. Um, and if that's the head of the enforcement division, then that's it. And I don't often, I don't meet with every single taxpayer who wants to meet me. I always assess because I get the sense that certain taxpayers sort of take chances with, with us. Um, maybe they know that I'm fairly new in the organization, so they think that they can give me a different version of the story. And meanwhile, this matter has been running long before I arrived. So I also exercise my discretion. And lately, I've actually said, look, I actually shouldn't be involved in operations. So I didn't, look, I don't know, I didn't know about that, what, what Sunita told you. But what I found here was that it wasn't unusual, for me at least, to meet with certain taxpayers. I have, in fact, the very first taxpayer that I met with was also asking for a suspension, a very big taxpayer. Um, that, you know, they had an issue with us collecting a debt, and understandably so. So I, I did participate in those meetings. Um, I didn't think there was anything wrong with it. Otherwise, somebody should have said something. I mean... No, I'm, I'm not asking about you. I'm saying, are there, are there protocols as to who in these circumstances mm. is permitted to meet with the taxpayer? I, I'm not asking you to defend yeah. you meeting with them. Yeah. I'm saying, I'm asking... Are there 